Hi, I'm Caitlin Kaju. I'm an animator and an illustrator. And I'm Ira Marks. I write and draw comics. And this is a podcast about the mysterious and magical and angelic process of bringing cartoon stories to life. In today's episode, we're adopting a miracle baby. (laughs) And we're gallivanting through the streets of Tokyo. Dangerously. Dangerously and hopefully and optimistically in Tokyo Godfathers. Welcome to Cartoon Feelings. Earnest. Earnest, yes. Earnest tone. (laughs) Church-like. red because i thought yeah. that was uh, I a, yeah. a bit of a redemption for disney pixar recently because no, i that's I true really i loved, loved that movie it's so fucking good i yeah. i think really that cute. the animation is like wilder than it's been stretchier than they've than yeah. they've done yeah it really did have like early 2010 like whatever like teen girl yeah. or like yeah. youth like energy and just like the like sailor moon vibes and like the stars in their eyes and mm-hmm. it was real nice yeah, it's it's nice to feel like Pixar is just sort of like an incubator for things that are not just again. the same. Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I liked it. And they mentioned maxi pads and have and girls having their periods, which I, I don't so think is much. a thing that's ever been in an animated movie. <laughs> like a lot <laughs> like, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like so many times. It was, I, I liked it. Yeah. And I like it when the plot is just dumb bullshit and that, like, they just want yeah. to go to a concert or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, that is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, totally. Way and... more interesting than going to space or whatever, but Right. Like, I'm tired of saving the world. <laughs> shit. And Pixar has to do it because I feel like concert. smaller budget productions don't get to do that because people get really nervous and mm-hmm. things just kind of sit in a weird middle ground. But it, there, it could be like, if Pixar can do it, we can do it, which I think is mm-hmm. really and nice. And we can but we can't. Yeah, no, we will. We'll do it. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jess and Caitlin. Ira. Jess. I- Ira. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you believe in coincidences? Yes. <laughs> okay. Next question. Yeah. Do you, you any follow up? Okay. Yeah. Well, do you, you want context for that question? I'd like. I'd enjoy some context. Here's a bit of context for this show. Kayla and I have a friend with us today, and her name is Jess Fink, and she is an award-winning cartoonist. And that's as serious a thing as will be said on the rest of this show. <laughs> In fact, we will not acknowledge her for the rest of it. <laughs> Hi, Jess. Thanks for being here. Thanks. I, I'm just going to be the the teacher that's reviewing you. I'll be sitting in the back of the class. Oh shit! Uh, paying notes. attention the whole time. So I, I think I just started sweating. I think I just started <laughs> crying. Yeah. Feel free to sweat. <laughs> okay, so no points off for sweating. That's good to know. We thought it was important to, uh, at least I did, to bring a guest on because I find that on the show, Caitlin's often like. I wonder about this, and I don't have an answer. But if we bring a third party on, <laughs> we can maybe ask they them. have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jess, you're here for the, the answers that neither of us have. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, now I'm sweating. Um... <laughs> Good. The tone, the vibe is set. Audience, I hope you're sweating, too. Uh... <laughs> Ooh, a tug's collar. <laughs> okay, back to coincidences for real. I, I think it's important to start with with the big questions, and then we'll zoom in and all the things that are just uh, perfect about this movie, which I think we agree on. Uh, oh, we haven't talked about it, but sure. <laughs> That's true. We have not even breached the subject of what this is. It's a safe though. <laughs> I am in full confidence that we all believe that this is a near-perfect movie. God, yeah. What if I was just like, you guys, this movie sucks. <laughs> I really <laughs> I agree. I thought it was really good. I um, I don't know if I should just keep talking at this point, but I just, I never, I didn't expect it to be so funny. Can you say what movie we're mm. talking about? Because uh, I feel like no. that's a, a boring thing, but it has to be done. <laughs> Tokyo Godfathers. Thank you. 2003 by... Satoshi Kong. <laughs> now that's teamwork. That's <laughs> information. 
And Kaylin, I think for both of us, this was like, we haven't seen it, even though yes. um, I love this director, but for some reason I uh, was skipping this one, which I'll explain I, like, why later. This is a director that I've been like slowly working my way through. And by that, I mean, I saw Millennium Actress a bunch when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, I named my hamster Chioko <laughs> after the main oh. character from that movie. And then I saw Paprika a few years ago. And honestly, um, it freaked me out. That's not surprising. No one hmm. probably... Um, so I just, I feel like I have to take his movies like a couple years apart at least. Cause uh, I was like, there's a lot going on in this and it's, it was really good, but it like was stressful. That right. wasn't fun mm -hmm. and cute. Like this movie is. Um, and then yeah, finally watch this one. I think I always avoided this one because in my mind, this is all changed now, but a Christmas movie can only really appear at a certain time of year. And this one, at least in its uh, branding, is so obviously a Christmas movie, even though obviously it's a lot more once you watch it. But so that that limited when I was going to watch it. And it just seemed like when you look at the other films in uh, this very short and tragic filmography, this is the one that seems like most boring on its surface. You're like, what's the bit? What's the gimmick? Where's like the surrealist, odd, dreamlike state of it? Um, but Jess was like, trust me, this is the movie we need to do. It's good. I'll be honest. I didn't know it was a Christmas movie. And I also always thought that maybe this was like a mob movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which it like is a little bit for like a minute. Mm hmm. But it's not that at all. So yeah. what's, your, what's your story with this one, Jess? Why? Why did why did you choose this for us? Um, I think it's just like been in the back of my mind for a long time. And and uh, last Christmas, uh, Eric, my partner, and I rewatched it, and we fell in love with it all over again. But we um, we actually saw it when we were going to school in Manhattan. We were in college, um, so we saw it in theaters when it came out. I just remember like absolutely adoring it. And it being one of those movies that made me be like, oh, my God, like these are films, you know, like these are mm. these should be recognized so much more than they are. Just it felt like such a beautiful little secret. And it was like mm. such a pleasure to be able to see it on the big screen. So it was just like it always been in my mind as just like a, a brilliant movie that wasn't talked about more. So I, I was watching an interview with the director from around the release time. It's it's very cheesy, and he talks to one of the voice <laughs> actors. And uh, there, it's not a lot of information, but if you watch it hard enough, you can kind of glean a little insight into how Satoshi Kon thinks about his projects. Because I think he he's just like a, a master of it. Like the this is like you were saying. I feel like this is like actual filmmaking. In in all realms, I feel like sometimes animation, the, the goals of it are limited to like a space or in a certain audience that limits what you can do. But this one is like able to somehow magically address so much. Back to coincidences. He says this little thing, and I'm just curious what you two think of this. He said the, the, the casting of the voice for Miyuki... Mm -hmm. was based on seeing uh, the actress in a film. And then right after seeing her face on the cover of, mag of a magazine, I guess in 2003, she was like a hot deal. And he said, the coincidence of that meant that this movie was going to be lucky. And I always look for coincidences in my work. I'm asking this question because now we have like three people that love to draw. And if you think of the things you make in this kind of way, like do you, do you find luck associated with the stuff you make? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think so much of being an artist is just based on luck, you know, like, you just happen to have like, a weird idea popped into your head one day, or you're messing around sketching something and it, you know, turned into something that you weren't you didn't sit down to intentionally draw. I feel like so much of it is just like, fucking around and finding out. And um, <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, yeah in a great way. <laughs> And like being successful at an artist as an artist too is, is a lot of luck being in the right place at the right time and all that kind of stuff. Caitlin, do you think, I think Jess and I know this word well, the the idea of tangents, because we both like draw comics, like the concept of I'm tangents. I'm aware of the tangent. So, but do you, when I was thinking of coincidences, I was like, even down to the idea of a tangent can be a coincidence. And it's like the thing with a tangent when two lines, if you don't know audience, like when two lines meet that are existing on different planes and they kind of break the illusion of the the image, that's called a tangent. Like if a cat's head was lined up with a garbage can and it made it seem like they were one object, that's a tangent. 
but that's also a coincidence that your like mind is looking for or like kind of tricking you into doing or trying. Uh, but I feel like, like you animate so much and I feel like you do so much more tech work. Do you still, do you have these things in your mind and like what part of your process do they exist in? Oh my God. That's, uh... is this like a weird NPR style interview show <laughs> I just all feel of a like sudden? that's such an advanced question. <laughs> I don't know. Can I answer the question that I was that you yeah. asked Jess first just oh, to cheat my sorry. way out of this? I'll come back to that. <laughs> but well, I really I was just thinking like that's true because like to some people I'm like a successful artist. I'm doing the air quotes. I don't know why. Like I have a job I think you're and doing that's great. fine. I do okay. <laughs> um but like I didn't mean to be a motion designer. It's just like what I had the opportunity to do and like it overlaps with my interests. Like we all know I like if I could have been a Disney animator, that's like what I would have done. And it just didn't happen but that like was not in my control you know like <laughs> yeah, so i yeah. just took the opportunities that i got and here i am so i guess that's i don't know to me that's like luck i feel like i didn't plan any of that whatsoever but you're like a drawer true first I'm and a foremost drawer. <laughs> yes <laughs> like yeah. the way you draw like you're definitely in pursuit of like an identity in the same way i feel like jess and i are where some people that draw you're like oh you want to just be a great concept artist for this thing not to put anybody in a category, but sometimes you can see <laughs> oh, it in people's good. work. Like, I feel like when you draw, you're like looking for something. Yeah, deeper. I agree with that, actually. I've been thinking <laughs> about that a lot. Yeah. Like, I do feel like for work, it's just harder to think about it in that way because I'm like, it's more goal oriented. I'm looking for something, but not that. I'm looking for like how to make video good. So client like video. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully I do that well. But for drawing, I don't know. It does feel very mysterious. This is such a cheesy thing to drop, and I'm sorry because I don't I don't know if I like advocate for this, but I read that book by the Eat Pray Love author that's not Eat Pray Love. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's called Big Magic. And it's about creativity. And the only thing I remember about it though, because it's very like spiritual and a lot of its language, which like I don't I can't really get into as much. But there was just one thing where she was like, creativity is actually just like collaborating with like the higher power or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, that's an interesting way to think of it. And I kind of agree with that because I can't hmm. sit down and look at a piece of paper and like make the perfect line that I'm seeing in my head. When I was a kid, I used to, I vividly remember that it was like the Gertie the Dinosaur cartoon. Yeah. I was like, I want to draw that exactly from hmm. my memory. And I could picture it in my mind and like, but I could not make it appear <laughs> exactly right on the paper. And it's like, it just doesn't work that way. I get, for some people it probably does. I don't know, whatever, but good for you guys. But for me, <laughs> yeah, like you, it just, you make the mark you make, you know, you can practice, you get better at technique and stuff, but like, that's how it comes out. And then some of my favorite drawings come out that way. It's just exactly how Jess was describing it. That like, I just sat, like a lot of the stuff that I make is usually because I sat down feeling like, oh, I'm going to draw today. And then I just like kick out something awesome. Yeah. And like half the time you do that and you kick out something that is bad. And you don't like, but then you just mm -hmm. do something else. So I, I don't know. I feel like it's something I can only take a certain amount of credit for. The the idea of like kind of like a spiritual connection. I was just thinking, uh, Jess, in case you were wondering, we're, we're going to talk a bit about the production of this film and then we're going to get into the story. So I, I was watching, you know, and reading about the making of this movie and the, the director is constantly... Not avoiding questions, really, but like speaking on this bigger concept level that doesn't really reveal a whole lot about the process, like this this kind of quote of like, oh, I'm looking for coincidences in my work and therefore it's about luck. You know, that doesn't really tell you a lot about the day-to-day -day process of it. But I was just thinking because we've been doing this jump back and forth of like movies made by Japanese directors, movies made by American directors and the way interviewers approach their subjects or and also the way these directors talk about their stuff. Like, I don't know, just my anime, like, do you, do you, if you were to pick <laughs> anime or like Western animation, do you, do you have something that like sits in your soul a little deeper or not? I, I think I, I would definitely go with anime just, just mm. because it feels like there, yeah, there are, there are more um, bold choices being made in anime than there are in Western animation. And I feel like Western animation so much of the time, unless we're talking about like independent animators, mostly like things that are made by and funded by a studio are made for a specific audience and demographic. And I feel like a lot of anime and, and other animated things from overseas uh, gets to be like the brainchild of the 
this one person, you know, it gets to be like uh, the, the director is in charge of their work. And I just, I just, I like that stuff more because it, it feels like it makes it a really unified vision. Mm. And I, and I just like, I just like bold, weird choices. I want to see some, some shit that's going to like blow my mind, be, be different, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like I do have like a, a lot of nostalgia for, for Western, you know, United States animated movies that I grew up with, like secret of Nim and stuff like that. But, mm. um, so I think that they, they can do good stuff, but I, I feel like more often I'm just like so drawn to anime because it feels like they're trying to make film. Yeah, I feel like that's how I felt when I was a kid. And yeah, I, I, I just mean the way the culture just addresses it as a whole. Like I feel like anime um, gets looked at, it, it, that there's, there's more to it. And that it can mean more things. The language of it is more expansive and unpredictable. Whereas like Western mm -hmm. stuff just really gets solidified. And most studios usually run down a track and it becomes redundant. And then they just become uninteresting. Whereas I feel like that's not quite, I mean, I'm sure the case is there in anime as much, but stuff that ends up here from Japan, I feel like we, we cherish it in a different way. Well, I, I think also there's like a lot less, we experience like, a lot less handholding from a filmmaker when we're watching anime. I feel like a lot of the time, I feel like most stuff that's made in the U S there, there, there is a certain visual language that is not going to be used. There's not like metaphor. There's not like, like, you know, I'm not saying that stuff is never used, but I feel mm -hmm. like I see it a lot more in anime that there, there are like it's... visual mo motifs and cinematography and stuff like that. It's used more shallowly. I feel like, and like, I honestly, not to just harp on this age old thing, but it's like so much Western animation is like for kids or like for the family. Like that's yeah. a huge part mm -hmm. of it too. And I agree with everything that both of you are saying. But also just like pure, like anime just has adult content. And it's yeah. it's not like it doesn't exist in the Western world, but generally it is just like straight up family oriented. Mm. You're never gonna see a boob like just to like in a Pixar <laughs> movie. Like it's yeah. literally never gonna happen, mm -hmm. uh, and that's just not how anime works. And you know what? If it did, I feel like it would be cherished in such a weird way <laughs> that it would be. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, like when you think of some of the Pixar movies that I, I in certain contexts would. Not in this context for some reason, but right now I feel very dismissive of Pixar in my mind. But when I watch Up, the first 10 minutes, I'm like, masterpiece, I'm crying, therefore masterpiece. Like, it's such a, mm -hmm. a simple one-to-one. -one. It's like, oh, they're doing this. I recognize it, therefore I think it's good, and it is good. But that's so uncomplicated. Like, it's not critical in any way. Whereas um, watching something like this, sometimes the editing doesn't tell you how to feel about a thing. Yeah. And, it's, and the soundtrack doesn't really either, which is usually, especially with Pixar, things hinge on the music so much. Yeah. Like, Caitlin, I feel like you always, not always, but you bring up th always. this idea of, like, the, with, the withholding of information, like, can make you feel more invested and, like, more mature of a viewer. And the same you could say that with yeah. kids too like it's fine to push kids by giving them less or like not telling them how to think about the thing they're looking at yeah you know? did we talk about the? i can't remember which episode we talked about this recently probably a multiple like mars and beyond and apollo 10 and a half but like a lot of western stuff feels very propaganda-y and like mm. it's mm. like they're telling you about i haven't seen lightyear but when i see ads for it i'm like this feels like America is awesome propaganda. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. I mean, I haven't seen it, so again, I don't know what it goes into, but it's just like, space is so cool. Like, and I get that's kind of the vibe where they're like riffing off. This is like a, I don't know, 80s or like 90s, like action movie, whatever, yeah, something yeah. like that. Which but, so many are funded, like something like Top Gun, that first movie, funded by the Navy. Yeah, so the military is has a lot of involvement in those movies, Even like the Transformers, like stuff like that. Oh, like, yeah. There's a lot of like military involvement and right. Marvel, like a ton of that stuff. That's like our bread and butter. We yeah. love story. I think we like uncomplicated stories in right. the West, mm -hmm. I guess. And like, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that I'm like, there's no way. Because yeah. you don't have an a American studio wouldn't be like, let's have a trans character. Yeah, That's yeah. never going to happen. And if Especially it did, they would be like, here's what we think about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I would be blown away, which is horrible mm -hmm. and really sad to see that in like a Western 
and even in just like western movies in general like mm-hmm. we tend not to go there in america yeah um, it's like there's a there's a media literacy that is like cut off there's a cut off mm-hmm. limit for media literacy in i feel like for american viewership or or you know that some you know executives seem to think that this is what americans can handle and mm-hmm. no more but i yeah. feel like i when i'm watching you know and like like a Satoshi Kon film, I feel like I'm being rewarded for paying attention and like, great. That's what I want. I love to feel like I am working something out in the movie that I'm, I'm, you know, finding out this information because the the movie is communicating with me, but like not verbally, you know, I'm picking it up because of the, the visual motifs and the, the direction. And it's, it's great. Let's let's talk about some of the, just the look, the look of this thing. So first of all, um, like you were saying, Jess, like a lot of a lot of these types of movies, these ones that kind of sit on a pedestal, the director has so much control. Uh, Satoshi Kon did storyboard this whole thing front to back by himself. It's kind of that Akira magic where you have this artist who is like a master of rendering in every way, like and directorial skill just kind of bringing it all to the table. And then um, I was thinking, I feel like once we get to the characters, we're never coming back. So let's, let's hold that <laughs> off. But, um, but just, just the backgrounds, like I, I did, I watched this and then I went back and watched it and just turned the sound off. And just cause I, I was having such a, a cozy feeling. This mm-hmm. movie is so visually warm. Uh, and also it's funny to say that because I feel like when something's more abstracted, I don't, get as cozy with outdoor urban landscapes, but the city, like the soft white of the snow with kind of the warm brown of the Tokyo cityscape, uh, just was very nice. In a way, something like another movie we talked about that um, in was like uh, Onward is really trying to render a cityscape, but it feels like wet and cold. Whereas this feels, even though it is cold, it's like so cozy. Mm. It's incredibly Mm -hmm. lived in. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I like. We were kind of talking about this all throughout already anyway, but like this place feels like a real place. It does not mm-hmm. ex- like yeah, cities and movies like that feel weirdly empty. Mm. And this yeah. is unfair. Uh, but I remember in The Incredibles like episode we <laughs> talked about there's there are the city at the end, whatever. There's like no people. It's like technologically right. they couldn't really do that. But like. <laughs> That's how a lot of those movies feel. They're kind of sterile in that way because like, there's no trash. Like there's no like socioeconomic tier. Yeah, it's right? like it's an like, art piece. Yeah, like a you know, an Art Deco art piece of the city. Whatever. That's the kind of. And this it just feels like it's dirty, but it's also like clean. Like there's a and they go to a party. This like yakuza boss party later, and it's in this just like overly ornate like baroque interior Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. ridiculous like there's all kinds of the variety but it all feels like real places Mm -hmm. you would actually Mm -hmm. go to i was looking at one of the art books like a pdf scan of it i did not buy it so you see cops (laughs) you heard it here first (laughs) you do see uh the tokyo (laughs) metropolitan building and then a really iconic set piece that whale sculpture in the park you remember that oh yeah that's mm-hmm. that's located near that building. And then I saw some other images like the bridge, the actual shot of the bridge. So I think it's right to feel that way. And I didn't really realize this because I have not been to any part of Tokyo. But a lot of this is actual, um, you know, based on a photograph stuff, which I think just that that level of research, not necessary, but just like goes that extra mile to make something believable for a, a piece like this. The closest analog I can think is like movie set in LA. Like they love to like <laughs> we love to have movie set in, even New York. I don't something about LA specifically. I feel this way. Maybe it's just the Hollywood thing. But they're mm. like it's a character, right? Like neon lights and like da 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 driving on the highway. Blah blah blah. This is how like it feels the equivalent of that where you're like oh like this couldn't take place in a different place. Yeah, because it would just mm. fundamentally change mm-hmm. everything about it in an unknowable way. There's for a me. <laughs> there's a did did you notice like the sort of. There's a lot of weird little light moments in this. I mean, some of them are very obvious, but I don't know. Were y'all like catching up on the, like the way lights would flicker in certain windows and in, in different mm. scenes? It's funny because like the joke of the city is a character. Like in this case, I'm like, it is, has a weird sentience to it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like there's yeah. wind and all these elements that, right? I, I did read something where uh, Satoshi Khan was talking about how he wanted there to be sort of like hidden faces in the backgrounds 
and and foregrounds oh. of some shots you know like made up of like things that were part of the background like you know bits of machinery or like heating ducts and stuff like that pipes he wanted it to be sort of like a very subtle like subliminal face almost mm. to make the city feel like it was had like a, an an animalism to it or or mm -hmm. um a spiritualism of love like little you know spirits watching over the characters and i thought that was really interesting and i i i read that after i watched the movie so then i went back and was like kind of looking in the background for like the little faces yeah i love that like he i feel like it's it, it's not so it's not really glaring but um hmm, it's just yeah. a nice little idea yeah i was thinking of um kind of the point of view of of this world compared to like uh, the the other films where we we're sometimes in the character's head, but we're really, we're watching them in a way. I might just be overthinking of this. I mean, maybe this is the case with most movies, but I feel like we're, I'm very curious to learn about these characters, which I guess is just like good storytelling, but it's like the city is watching them and I'm, sud I'm subtly noticing that and I'm watching them in the same way the city is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a real stoner, like '90s stoner thing to no, say? I think that's movie? straight up like <laughs> intended. And um, okay, well, I, yeah, I read yeah, this. Yeah. My research game on this was very short due to just you know pet shenanigans and stuff. This this mm. I didn't have a lot of time, unfortunately. I'll put to, the footnotes on on so all that. Backstory all of the, in the comments. Yeah, all of the bearing um, <laughs> is on you to bring that research information. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but so this is straight straight from the Wikipedia page, but. Yeah, he not only said something that, like, when he first imagined the story, that he imagined Tokyo being a protagonist, specifically, like, a protagonist named Tokyo is there, like, sort of participating <laughs> oh, okay. in the story, like, observationally. Yeah. Um, I mean, I get, it's just basically confirmation that that is accurate. Uh, I think he said something, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of Tokyo, like, sustaining these people, in a way. Mm, like, yes. Tokyo is just kind of... Because they're homeless in Tokyo and they are able to be where like alive because of Tokyo and like being in this. And it, it's not like presented as a good or a bad thing. It's more just like a fact of their situation. And so all of this time he's thinking about hmm. Tokyo in that way. Yeah, I, I read that too. I, I thought that was really nice. And he, I think it was something like, even though the city has created all this homelessness, it's also the, you know, like. The, the affluence of the city is what allows them to survive. And so it's like, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's like a weird, they're not a weird, weird in that it is complicated, like a harmony to it in the way a, another like dramatic city character like Gotham is not like Gotham is like one beat <laughs> and it evokes a certain thing. Whereas like this version of Tokyo you could imagine many stories happening in it, whereas Gotham only tells a couple types of stories, and that's like its goal. But I find a complicated uh, city much more attractive, I'll say. Oh. Oh, <laughs> it feels like these are just people alive that are real people living. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're homeless. Like, that's not we're doing great and we're thriving and we're like super healthy and all of this stuff. It's not that, but it's like they are real people. Like, just the treatment of homeless people as like people with thoughts and feelings and doing great. Another thing mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever seen in Western animation. Okay. Yeah. I challenge you. <laughs> to, but one thing I really like just as like an aesthetic detail is that a lot of the time when they're in, um, like they're basically their cardboard houses, like mm. they're literally house shaped and uh, numerous mm. times it happens. And even in a dream sequence at one point it transition, it's still in a dream sequence. It's not actually happening. But Miyuki is, like, having a dream, and uh, she thinks she's home. She's, like, having a flashback mm, to what happened yeah. in her home life. And then it transitions to her being with uh, with her friend, like, her homeless friends. And it the cardboard, like, structure that they're living in is the exact same shape and layout of her home. And it just that kind oh, yeah. of aesthetic parallel is really interesting. Well, that's one of those, like, evoking coincidence or what's the difference... I could look this up. Not going to. What's, you know, the difference <laughs> between pod, yeah. like, uh, you know, a ser seren something serendipitous or something synchronistic? Kismet. Mm. Kismet mm. is the difference. No, <laughs> just, that's just, another yeah, term. Yeah, just establish. Yeah. For those who don't know, kismet. <laughs> but it's that same idea, like the, the, the thrill or like the comfort of something just kind of lining up just right. Like you're describing that transition. It's such like a beautiful 
in the way it's invisible, like just blends into the other thing. Um, You don't have to think that hard about it. And I won't. But we will talk a lot about it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. It's, I, uh, I could say this probably about any movie. This is great timing that we're doing this movie because I've had this weird question. It began early on with Incredibles where I'm like, I don't understand how much money any of these characters have, and that's bothering me, and I don't believe in them because I don't know how rich or poor they are. And then that question (laughs) turned into something more like, what is missing from these characters? And then I decided later it was a faith in a religion, and there was this lack of religion in some of the movies we were talking about, as if there was a need for it. But somewhere in my mind, I'm like, there's something missing that could just bring these characters to life in a little more a little more and here we are in a movie that's like about all of those things all religion one religion or is religion just like a, a veneer on this i don't know where where is re- religion go in this cuz it it is here well and i will and say I, I googled it because i was like so don't she go on christian question mark and google was like almost certainly not i guess yeah. it wasn't confirmed but i just thought that was really interesting then to make a movie that is so like rife with Christian imagery and it opens on like a nativity scene mm. and even the kid's name I guess Kyoko like that name comes up a bunch in this movie as well what a coincidence mm-hmm. um but apparently that's also like um in the Japanese translation of Silent Night like yeah, that's, yeah. it's like a, mm. a nod to that there's a ton of stuff like that and then Hana the best character who I love so much it's just constantly like, God loves this child. Like, God this, mm. God that kind of stuff. It just like comes up so much. And this, I was kind of wondering, like, I, this doesn't feel like a preachy movie to me, but I was like, oh, I wonder if there's some kind of, you know, maybe he grew up in, like, you know, Christ, in a Christian family or something in Japan. Like, not as far as anyone is aware. Yeah, I don't find the movie to be preachy either. I, I feel like it's just a quality that makes these characters even more real because it feels like this is this is an aspect of of... Uh, their lives and I, and I think they go to a shrine at a few points and I'm not mm-hmm. sure like what what religion is represented in those shrines but yeah it, it feels like um it just feels very Japanese it helps it to feel like very culturally Japanese I think it's the representation or the way it, it seems like kind of just an aesthetic is true of Japan I think it's it's an v- extremely low statistic like the amount of Japanese people that like subscribe to Christianity. I feel like it's like in the single digit percents, but the novelty of Christmas is like extremely powerful in the way, like when you go to Disney world at Christmas time, it's like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't see faith in my Disney Christmas, but I love it more than I could love any God. Like, I feel like they, like they, (laughs) this podcast is so controversial. (laughs) But the, 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 the belief that Christmas and uh, the religious aspect of Christmas ex- exists as like has a time and a place and a feeling totally exists in this movie. But the deeper sense of like an undying faith to like the idea of a God and to live your life by that is it's not quite the same. Because every right, all the yeah. right, you know, like I don't know. There's like a subtle difference there. And there, there is one point where Miyuku like makes fun of her mom, who's very religious. Yeah, know, yeah. The like praying <laughs> hands. And, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like it. The movie has, you know, I feel like it doesn't feel preachy because of that. It feels like that that these are just uh, characteristics. Yeah, I feel like that's when I, you know, I brought that up to say that there, there's like spot. There's places for this in any dramatic story, and I would just like it to occur more. Like, yeah, the the mom panicking and reverting to prayer hands says yeah. so much about that character who you don't meet, the way she, like, linked. She's, mm-hmm. like, kind of around, halfway around a corner. You see what that means for her to feel like that instead of her just cowering and crying. It's, like, specific enough where you're like, oh, I get her. Just mm-hmm. enough, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm saying is more religion in animation <laughs> all around put god back in animation <laughs> however you use it i don't care just get it in there well and i think what you're kind of circling around and have been like when we bring this up is that it makes people feel more real because you have that and like religion isn't just religion where it's like oh praise him praise him but it's also like a mm-hmm. big cultural thing mm-hmm. so because like you get the feeling when they're at the nativity scene at the beginning and everybody's singing silent night and it's 
this whole thing. And then they're like at a like an outdoor soup kitchen basically after that. And you really get the feeling like they are they went to this Christian charity event to get food and like have a chill time kind of, not mm-hmm. because they are all devout right. Christians mm-hmm. on the street, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Uh and yeah, it just feels like, well, this is a part like this is the world and they have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people mm-hmm. think these things and they have these things. And then it does just give a nice parallel to like the miracle baby. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of the whole, you know, plot point and like bringing people together. But I, I like that at the beginning when uh, they're listening to basically a sermon. Uh, I don't know if it's like a priest, I guess, giving this sermon at the nativity mm-hmm. scene. But he's talking about people having a place to belong. And that's really what the movie's about. It's like what he's saying is like something you could believably hear in a sermon or a homily. It's not like the normal stuff I remember hearing in church about Christmas and like Christ and stuff. It was right. really about like people like having their found family which is basically what this movie is about and i, I just thought that was also really nice it's like a perfect place to introduce the theme oh yeah totally and i feel like that theme just sort of appears in little moments in the way that the city is alive and there there's a, a scene later in the movie where we kind of run the characters are running and we we meet all like in just quick moments little family scenarios like we see all these like parents with babies throughout and and it just makes the it it's like the city is available to you if you're in like the right time and place for any given situation which is just like a very uh nice kind of hopeful feeling that lets this story get as dark and as sad as it wants to cuz that's still like always kind of there right well, it's weird. I don't really feel like this movie even though it's like dealing with really intense stuff, like it never felt heavy to me. Mhm. Mm-hmm. It just it feels very cute, honestly. Oh, I did I, I did have a moment where I got very sad for a second, but I will get there. But I I came out of it quickly. Pick your saddest <laughs> moments. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll save that for the back half. <laughs> Top 5 saddest moments. Um, okay, I just want to appreciate a li- a little bit more <laughs> I did bring up the religion thing, but I'm going to jump back to like the the look of of the movie. Um, a couple religion things. Religion is an aesthetic. <laughs> I, I like to read the the part of the production notes where they talk about how they set up the background layers because I feel like this this isn't something I ever thought about before we were doing the show, but it becomes the thing I really get um, caught up on when we're talking about the production because I feel like the way the backgrounds are dealt with says a lot about how the whole production. Is, is approached. So the background's kind of flat scanned mats, but they're tiered in ways where you can have really subtle camera movements. So like in one of the videos I was watching, they pan down to the park, but the building in the background stays still, the trees kind of slide at a different rate. And then the, the foreground elements like the, the big whale slide at a different speed. It's like, I was trying to think of 2003 and what other animations were doing at that time. Like What's the Disney equivalent? Where are we? Are we at Lilo and Stitch? It's got to be around Ditch that time, yeah. Ish, or, um, we're probably getting into really that first wave of DreamWorks, that really dark, dark time of uh, over the hedge-ish stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's thinking... classic. That's what I was going to suggest that. For sure, us. yeah, we can do that next week. But I, I was just thinking of how Matt paintings were dealt with at this time uh it's just so lovingly traditional at a time where i think things were really jumping to like cgi elements yeah see i was gonna say i was like i feel like this is a treasure planet era and that came out in 2002 and that was like disney's like look at all the 3d we got in here yeah this is (laughs) this Uh... is such a world away from that approach not even like discussing story just yeah that one it was just yeah we're doing crazy stuff and we're like going into space and we're like the camera's everywhere but uh, yeah, one of my favorite, this is so weird. One of my favorite shots in this movie is like, so, I think it might be the pan up when they find the baby, but like the foreground plane is just a pile of garbage. And then the background <laughs> plane is a bunch of garbage. Yeah. And it's such a simple <laughs> thing. But I was like, this is so aesthetically nice. Like, yeah. I, what wonderful garbage. They got, the garbage artist <laughs> in this movie was really talented. Yeah, it's beautiful. I don't even know how to describe it, right? It's just trash. Perfect trash. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Beautiful garbage. I love that. Jess, do you have any just like frames of, of this movie that just sort of sit in your brain since your your college uh, years of watching it? I I love what our introduction to Miyuko is her like spitting on people like oh, over yeah. the side of a building. And then it pans up to like the person who got spit on looks up to see who's spitting on them. And it's just this big <laughs> billboard of like, you know, some like, you know, 
terrible advertising from the 90s with a, like a pretty model with angel wings and <laughs> Miyuko is just sitting up there spitting on people. It's just, it's great. And I, I really love, yeah, the, the subtle 3D in the background is like really well used. Yeah, mm. just like panning down alleyways. Like it's not being used to make, you know, some big crazy like action movie. Yeah, it's coming moment. out of the screen. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not right. framing like a like a chase scene or anything. It's just like trying to make you feel like you are more in that environment. Yeah, you really get a lot of there's a lot of really nice symmetry in the staging of shots, but then you also get these really deep quarters like that shot from the top of the building, the exaggeration of that point of perspective. It's like, you can only really do that if you're committed to this kind of flat 2D-ness. Like, I feel like with, once you get into 3D, the, the types of lenses you can simulate are, are feel really limited. Like you can't evoke that, that, that type of perspective, I feel like with 3D stuff as much, like maybe we're kind of getting there with like the sort of spider verse revolution of like the, the rules of this world are very geometric in all kinds of artsy ways. So deal with it. If you don't like art, fuck you. Like we're doing art stuff. <laughs> so you can, you can kind of do that now, but I feel like there was a while where the, the camera of animation was very boring and like cell art was way more evocative. And I miss um, that. Yeah. It was a good time. It was it was good times. And not to get like too wanky about 2D animation cuz I do I do that for sure and I feel like maybe we do that on the podcast. But like with 3D, everybody loves 3D because you can like I can move the camera. So like, oh, mm -hmm. we have this scene I'm like, well, what if I like take the camera and put it over there instead? Like that could be a cool shot. I'm an executive. Like, I don't know. <laughs> People have to do what I say. But in animation like no, like 2D animation you can't do that. And so if you see a really exaggerated perspective shot like that, somebody had to meticulous especially in the olden days, like Akira mm -hmm. was dizzying for that because it was just like, here's an mm. insane <laughs> perspective shot. Yeah. And you know that like 18 wrists died at like the oh. hands of this like severe <laughs> carpal tunnel. You know, like people had to Cartoon really casualties is your bust thing. Bust cartoon <laughs> yeah. deaths, yeah. We should have an obituary in every episode. Like, it's like if somebody had to intentionally really pick at that perfect shot mm -hmm. and it's not like 3d animation is actually easier it's just that i think a lot of it is maybe more manipulable manipulatable mm. yeah uh so yeah people are playing around with stuff that like assets that exist and then they get in there and they start like futzing around with stuff and there's just something about the attention and like the craftsmanship about 2d stuff that we really like so yeah. the the okay so the the um a lot of this movie comes down to this idea that this is something I think a lot. I don't know if you two relate to this term, like the pushing a pose. Like, or have you thought about that when you like do a character design? Is that like a, a familiar thing? The idea mm -hmm. that like, well, I could draw it this way, but if I exaggerate it this way, it gets my point across. Like, yeah. so, mm -hmm. you know, when you have a director with a vision like that, like clearly this is like exactly this case. And we get, we go down this rabbit hole a lot, especially when we talk about Disney, because he's clearly strong arming things and pushing them to a limit that turns Snow White into a masterpiece that's timeless. But at the cost of like, what, you know, how many people died under the hand <laughs> of like the seven dwarfs? So many people. <laughs> Satoshi Khan, at least in the, pre the very limited presentation I've seen of him, and he died sadly in 2010 of pancreatic cancer so like we don't we didn't really get to really see what he was going to do i feel like he was the wave of his work in america was just hitting like mm -hmm. in when uh, you know um but he seemed quite gentle and um you know a, a little like i think japanese culture has its like masculine tendencies a little more in the forefront. Like I think America at this time was a little more self-conscious. So he kind of seems like he's pushing the women around a little bit, but overall he seemed like kind of nice. I don't know. Did, did you ever, did you watch any interviews with him where you like got a read on how he kind of seemed in the workplace? I've never seen um, him. Yeah. No, but, okay. but I did never read mind. that he, he worked <laughs> with, um, he, well, he had a female co-writer on this one who, who yeah. was. Oh yeah. She did um, Cowboy Bebop. Right, yeah, and I think he worked with other women um, for other movies. I think for Perfect Blue, he worked for another lady writer, and um, and Paprika too. But yeah, I I haven't seen any interviews with him to get his vibe. Well, his protagonists yeah. tend to be 
female, and I don't know why that yeah. is, but it's something that's it, well, like that always stands out to me. He actually had a quote about that I pulled from something where I can't remember exactly what it said, so I didn't pull it, but I remember it slightly. He said um, he chooses female protagonists because I think it it becomes a little more curious for him to explore a story through a point of view that's not like directly, I guess, connected to him, which makes sense to me. I feel like I, I do that too. I feel like I've always leaned towards female protagonists in my story because I, I kind of want to know how they're going to engage with what's and respond to characters more so than like a young boy because I'm like, I've already heard that story. That was me. And it was embarrassing. <laughs> Boring. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to like live this other life. I don't know. I don't know, Jess. Like, I've read a lot of your comics. And I, I think because I draw comics, I think about that. And I just would like when you plan a character, do you, do, do you think about stuff like that? I mean, I know they all happen naturally. But like, do you think of like the journey you're going to go on when you create a character? I do. I feel like I, I struggle with creating characters that, um, are very very different from me like hmm. i i feel like i've often been sitting there just like racking my brain like what something that could happen to this person that didn't happen to me <laughs> oh, wow. who yeah. are you what are conflicts that people have in their lives what's a conflict like you know <laughs> so i just feel like my characters wind up being like some mix of stuff that is me or is relatable to me because of that. It sounds like that's exactly what he's trying to avoid is like that yeah. exact <laughs> stress that you're, you're feeling. So maybe, maybe he realized that and he's like, okay, I got to get out of, get out of this space. Well, and I think too, that like his movies always have feminist themes and there's a lot of feminist themes in um, his TV show too. The, um, oh, what was the show called? Why am I blanking on that now? I didn't know it, he had a TV show. Yeah, there's an anime series. We watched it, but but it was a long time ago, like after it came out. Paranoia Agent. Paranoia Agent. Oh, um, yeah. Yes. I'm not Googling it. <laughs> it's great. I highly recommend it. It's it's super good. But there are a lot of feminist themes in that, too. And I, I feel like it's probably just something he was passionate about, you know, like a, a feminist ideals and exploring those things. Yeah, which I mean, makes me think that he was probably a really cool guy. <laughs> yeah, he seems really chill. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's like my read. That's why you know we we can't say, of course, exactly, but like my read, just based on his, like I feel like it does come down to curiosity. Like, are you curious about the story you're trying to tell, or are you fucking forcing a point of view through a plot, uh, you know, obstacle course? Like, I feel mm -hmm. like sometimes you know when you watch certain directors, you're like, ooh. You just really don't enjoy the world. You're just like powering mm -hmm, through mm -hmm. it on your own thing. But there, there's so much like give and take and like the dynamic. Okay. Time to talk about these characters. Open this pit <laughs> just up. that, the, this like these, this perfect like triangle of like energies these characters make is so amazing. There's a million ways to talk about it, but the, 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 him allowing these characters to emerge, like I think you know, we, we talk about directors having a vision. Like, I don't think anything ever comes out fully formed or is even a singular vision. It's always like it's the whims of the people and forces that inspire you. The, like him letting these three characters exist is just like, that's what genius is. I think him allowing this to happen with his like creative team. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> Yes. I can edit out that that blank spot, but please do because I was like, and now, I... well, I. Uh... How about let's just talk about like the character. We'll we'll get into I the story. I'm trying to hold to... off, but I oh, have yeah, yeah, all right. Like to revisit sort of something we were talking about early on about the fa like the found family ness hmm. and just all the family parallels. Uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, that like this these three characters are a family together mm -hmm. as one family unit and that's the parallel and like there's so many reasons that that is really cool and interesting and they're just they're all great and they have these hilarious dynamics it doesn't feel icky there's no point where i'm like <laughs> the mom parallel is clearly being naggy mm. you know mm -hmm. i really feel like we're do doing a dunk on pixar super hard today and i apologize <laughs> for that but 
And I was so annoyed at the joke in Inside Out where it's like the dad is just a dad and he loves sports and he doesn't oh, understand that. feelings. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. wife has a, yeah. like the fantasy about the guy she should have been with. And I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> I guess all Western families are really lame. That sucks. According to this, like this <laughs> throwaway joke in a film, whatever. But it's just not like that. And it's it's more just like Hana and Gein like have a uh, relationship like they just they clearly like each other and are yeah. friends and like have known each other for a while and care about each other. But then they also like fight about mm-hmm. like really hard headed stuff. And there's a point where Han at the end is just like tearing him a new one because it's just like you're just so beyond the pale. Like he lied about this and he lied about that. And like that is just so ridiculous. And it's just like, yes, like people have this fight. They yeah. don't <laughs> fight about maybe they fight about stupid stuff like, oh, Stop thinking about sports and, like, pay attention to your family or whatever. <laughs> yeah, people have that fight. But that just felt like a real thing. Like, those are the resentments that build up over a mm. long-term mm. relationship where you know each other and you actually still really care about each other. That's mm-hmm. the kind of stuff that you'll, like, randomly have a fight about because you actually are very involved with each other and, like, know each other on an intimate level. Mm-hmm. And then you have to deal with just each other's, pre- like, predispositions uh, where Han is very like motherly and loves that and it's like almost too much in a way where (laughs) she's just obsessive about it and like it's very over the top about the baby a lot of the time and then the um he who's like a failed father essentially in his life he like abandoned his family because he had all these gambling debts and all of this stuff um and has all this guilt about it and is sort of just like essentially a deadbeat dad I guess Mm -hmm. but he's still like participating in the family stuff Mm. like all of them have the like opportunity for growth and change but it doesn't feel like really dry and obvious it just feels like actually really cute and heartwarming at the end like this is a real family Uh, we talked about this in our lost uh, mitchell's versus the machines episode i think where it's like that family doesn't really feel very real their conflicts don't aren't really a real thing they just like we kind of don't get along i guess and my dad like doesn't appreciate my creativity or something but they're Mm -hmm. very much like people any family could just project themselves onto and this is not that but these characters i like a lot more (laughs) yeah it feels very surface level i feel like in 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 other things but i yeah there is like a a, the the movie takes makes space for those moments to happen for us to see those real moments it like sets aside time and space for you to see their family dynamic working and like there's a scene where they're they're in the beginning they're sifting through a trash pile because hannah is like i found a gift for you i found this like (laughs) series of encyclopedias of like children's stories or something (laughs) and she's like you have to have it for christmas and you know and miyuki's like why would i want that that's so dumb and and gin and hannah like just had a fight you know five minutes ago but he immediately comes to her defense he's like you know she she just wants to give you a present you're a you're a runaway child you should have a present for christmas (laughs) and it's so sweet to see like they were fighting a second ago but he immediately comes to her aid and like stands up for her to miyuku like you know like a mom and a dad yeah that feels like a marriage to me yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and you come in so in the midst of, I mean, I know this story is the story, it, it all is the arc of like discovering this baby. That's the story we're following. But in terms of their story, you're coming in hot on it. Like they're all lived in already. They're already fighting at a 10. Like yeah. there's, I feel like sometimes the cartoon's like, we're going to ease you in. Don't worry. You're going to get to know these people before there's any yelling or anything. Like you're, you're just like thrown right in the midst. And it's, there's a great, I, I I was thinking of like, we haven't done a whole lot of anime, but I, I feel like something I've said early on is like, I hit a wall with some of this stuff because aesthetically overall, I, I didn't grow up with a lot of it. And it's hard for me to get in there. There's something about this. It's got an, just enough squash and stretchiness in its characters. The characters have this extreme cartoon dynamic, like visually, you got mm-hmm. like Hana's a, a rectangle. Jin is like a, I guess he's kind of squarish. And then of course, like the teen girl is, is round and it's just so clear, (laughs) like visually, you know, in a way that, uh, like we're doing Akira, it's like all the boys are varying heights, but (laughs) visually like they're anime boy. Yeah. Their chins are all exactly the same. (laughs) Yeah. They're like, sometimes they're bloody or sometimes they're not, but they're all kind of gaunt 
you know, 120 pound like <laughs> teens. But mm -hmm. this is like these three characters are just so distinct in a mm -hmm. way that I, I feel like a lot of stuff doesn't allow it to be unless the director is really like, no, here's why, here's how we're doing it. And I have a million reasons and we're, we're doing it. These characters look so cartoonish. Uh, it's just, it's like great. But Hana is one of my favorite character designs I've seen in so long. Yeah, it's fucking, yeah. It's you'd, perfect. Yeah. I just love her so much, so yeah, much. she's and so like, expressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when she's yelling at people, it's absolutely the funniest thing in the world. Yeah. The facial expressions are amazing. I was trying to dig that that character. Yeah, that character is like so striking. I mean, like char just visually, right? Like, of course, there's there's so many layers of it. But I was trying to look because I'm like, there's got to be kind of a visual reference for something like this. And I was looking at some old, you know, Japanese like illustrative work historically, like to the 12th century or wherever, because there's something about just the the angularness of the jaw and the the red fullness of the lips that just reminds me of old. Japanese like papyrus illustrative works like big scroll work that you would see mm -hmm. like old samurai stuff I don't know I mean sometimes I go down those like just concept or not concept art but like historical art rabbit holes and there's something that uh, her design kind of evokes and then looking into samurai stuff you inevitably end it the samurai story of how so many of them were gay and you you find the great article mm -hmm. the gay of the samurai mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, this is interesting. You're like, ah, like Japanese culture was so progressive before it was corrupted by the West. But then you realize that like the gay backstory is it's it's like um, adult men like and boys. So you're like, OK, this is like too too complicated. I have to get out of this. That's <laughs> There's a lot of that going on historically, I think. Yeah, but it's funny to just go back and forth when you're you're trying to like find the source of an idea because I don't know for some this this movie has echoes of like so much culture that I'm like, oh, there's got to be a thing here, and then you go go there and you're like, oh, there's a lot more back there than um, than I was looking for. I don't have a follow up for that, but I love that. And like, I just want to <laughs> it's say, a dead end, as I described. Well, you were just, you said one thing about. Once like, I get to like pedophilia, it's like, that's just sort of. The <laughs> wall. Not the first time, and it won't be the last. Uh, well, I just, this is like a break from the podcast content, sort of, but like, I appreciate that you go down those historical art rabbit holes because you find really interesting stuff like that. And that's like, <laughs> I think it's worth talking about. Like, something uh, I like about anime mm -hmm. is because they have all of these things that we don't culturally know because I didn't grow up in japan as a japanese person and it's just like it's a major media enterprise i don't know genre i guess from a totally different culture and that is something that is just kind of rewarding to watch in and of itself like, yeah there's an argument for that like i guess you can watch like it's really easy for us to watch um western movies and be like oh they're clearly like referencing this thing from the 70s or whatever but like in akira mm. we had a cool conversation a really really short conversation we didn't get into the details but about like motorcycle gangs being a big thing in like the 80s in japan mm -hmm. and that being a big part of why it was in akira and it's like i would never have known that you know right. just like by myself so well that's the magic of like finding studio ghibli when you're young you're like what the hell is this story, <laughs> mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I feel like we all have those moments. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it, anime is, this is the thing that makes me feel like so old when I talk to younger <laughs> people about this because anime is so accessible now. Like, you can just watch animation from, like, any country you want. Mm. Like, you could find it. And, you know, when we were kids, you had to, like spend $25 or $30 on a VHS tape and just take a gamble that, right. you know, maybe it was what you Hopefully wanted. Like, this is it's good. just going to be two random episodes from Ranma one half. And like, you know, maybe <laughs> that'd be cool. You don't even know what season they're from. <laughs> like it's just happened to be at the store and you're taking a chance. And I feel like it's just seemed like such a, a magical item because it was both so relatable and everything you wanted. And also, had a lot of stuff in it that you didn't understand that wasn't culturally re relevant to you, but it was still so interesting and just like, wow, you could just, they make cartoons for adults over there. Like what's <laughs> happening? 
Nice. Did this, yeah. Jess, did this movie, because you were at that just perfect, I feel like whatever, the age you were describing running into this, I'm just so jealous. I'm like, God damn, I would have loved to have been like 20 and seen this in a theater. I would have like felt so cool. Like, was there merch? Cool. Like, did you get a t-shirt or I don't no. know? No, there, no, like, there was no like fanfare. Nothing, right? No, yeah. it was like, you know, we went to see a lot of uh, Ghibli movies when they came out because like, I feel like I had just found out about Ghibli movies, like maybe in my first year of college. And they started putting those in theaters. I think we saw Princess Mononoke in the theater. We saw Spirited Away in the God theater, you know, and they were all dubbed. You couldn't see them in, you couldn't get the sub, you know, like you have to see it dubbed, but, <laughs> um, but it was, it was like super magical. It was like exactly what we wanted, you know, growing up as art students, we just wanted to like go see something that was going to blow our fucking minds. <laughs> Yeah. Just went to school in New York. Caitlin and I often reminisce about our, our more rural like upbringings. <laughs> yeah. I definitely relate to Well, like I, I like that though. Like I like kind of miss the, I get nostalgic for like the blockbuster era because that's mm. when like we found millennium actress in blockbuster mm. and I was like preteen or like yeah. early teens. And we were like, hell yeah. Cause that's how we saw them. We found Princess Mononoke the same way. Mm -hmm. Like all of that. We would just go and get weird anime movies or whatever and watch them. And like, I definitely didn't understand literally anything that was going on in that movie, but I loved it. And I was like, I will name my hamster this. <laughs> this <is a> great <laughs> film. And that was like, that was, that was like kind of magical in and of itself. One of my coworkers today recently told me that there's a website, animeplanet.com, that is basically just Goodreads for anime, where you can, like, log the episodes that you've seen. And I was like, well, that is different. That is different. <laughs> yeah, stuff is not the same anymore. Uh, but, yeah, end of sentence. I, I do. I still have a box of VHS tapes of anime that I, like collected as a teen that were like my prized possessions on earth like this magical box of like 10 vhs tapes that i watched over and over and over again and i well you gotta just tell us what they are right now Do you have uh, any, all the gen same tape of uh, Rama one the half yeah. <laughs> the same two episodes yeah definitely there's like at least three ranma tapes and then both ranma movies and then there is like um there's a sailor moon movie that i got from uh we visited i don't remember we, it was on a family vacation and i found a chinatown and i was like i have to go to this anime store that's in chinatown please <laughs> i like beg my parents to like like just let's make a stop because i need to have anime and i like didn't even matter what anime it was i just needed to go in there and get something and i got like a sailor moon movie i don't even remember which movie what the title of it is but it's like it's the one where Luna becomes a human and like falls in love with a man. And it's, it's just, it's so weird. And I loved every fucking minute of it. <laughs> so it was always just like this, this strange thing that like, you know, you would either watch it at Blockbuster where there were like two shelves of anime to choose from. <laughs> and, and it would be like crying free man and fist of the North star and apple seed. And like, mm. and I'd be like, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I'll watch anything. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I I'm feel like that box is just <laughs> random stuff. Just wait, I, I, and it'll go in the Jess Fink Museum someday. I feel like it's okay. I'm going to open a can of worms, even though we should get into like the story of this movie. But I have to ask both of you this because I don't have this in my life, and I'm a curious person, much like this director. Uh, so, anime, Jess, like the way you describe <laughs> it, it's like I didn't have a relationship with any aspect of cartoon culture in that way, because I felt like you couldn't wrap your arms around it in the same way. You can be like, take me to anime town and get me whatever's there. Cause that's <laughs> what I need. And like, you can't say that really about any other genre or type of thing other than maybe you can be like, take me to music town and give me all the punk albums. Right. Like mm. was anime just a, like you just needed it. I see this with like students so often. Everybody goes through that phase. Not everybody, but when you get in that phase, you will not step outside those guidelines. You will draw anime eyes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. even at the risk of being expelled from like an art program or something. <laughs> like, did you did you have that like intense window? Oh my god! Can, yeah, yeah. Can you reflect 100%. on everything I drew was anime mean? eyes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. like what? Is it like there was a lack of other stuff for you? Like, what do you, can you tell? Like, why? 
Uh, I mean, I, I, I was like, I I loved cartoons. I was obsessed obsessed with animation, you know, and I think I was just desperate for anything that was a little bit older. I feel like I had outgrown Disney mm, in a way. Like okay. I was still watching it and like consuming it and loving it, but not feeling like it represented me or any of my interests really. Like I, I, I recognized that it was like still Disney was still speaking to like a younger audience. Hmm. Cause I was like 16, 15. I wanted like something that was doing something a little more interesting. Okay. And um, yeah. I remembered like discovering sailor moon and it was on at like, 6 a.m. and I it would like be the episode would be ending as I was supposed to be like getting on my bus to go to school <laughs> and I like <laughs> missed my bus so many times because I had to see the ending of Sailor Moon even though the ending of Sailor Moon is exactly the same every time <laughs> you never know though maybe this time it'll be different <laughs> <laughs> but I was just like desperate to see like animation that was for like teenagers i don't know de- animation that was like taking it a little more seriously is that how you and your sister were feeling at that blockbuster caitlin honestly it, i don't like you're, it's a little younger for you i feel yeah like that, right uh, but i feel like it was kind of coming from the same place because i vividly mm. remember that we saw princess mononoke was when i was in fourth grade because mm, the um little, wow. like, the little um tree spirits um, would rattle their heads or whatever, and my dad mm. would be like, "Oh, they're fourth graders," and he was like, he'd make fun of it. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> but like that, I'll never forget that. Um, and I just thought it was the coolest shit ever. I mean, first of all, like huge wolves were like my shit. Mm. That was like so fucking insane. But just like, there's so much blood in that movie, and it like didn't phase mm. me at all. And I think I was just like ready for that in a weird way. Like I was a very sensitive child. Mm. Um, my mom loves to tell a story about how she forbade me to go see Jurassic Park in the theaters because I was too young, and she knew that I wouldn't be able to tell that it wasn't real. <laughs> And I was, like, pissed, I guess, as, like, a little baby toddler of, like, not being able to go see the dinosaur movie. She was 100% right, because I would have had actual night terrors from it, probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I guess in fourth grade, I was ready. And it was, I think it was just, like, because I still, I don't think I ever really got tired of Disney movies. I mean, or, like, you know, and I'd watch whatever. And maybe The Gateway was, like, Pokemon, I want to say, mm, for us okay, in a way, right. maybe, where that was, like, what we would tape the episodes because we had to leave for school too early to see them. And, like, we just, like, Pokemon was so huge when we were kids. So it's, like, everybody's getting into anime from that. And then, like, Toonami was a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And just, like, watching all of that stuff. And then, like, I think there was just something so magical about going and watching these movies and, like, literally not understanding them, really, because we were too young. But that they were just so, like... The world of Princess Mononoke was so huge that I just, like, couldn't believe it. Like, I just couldn't believe what <laughs> oh, I was seeing. Oh, yeah, just the scale. Yeah, yeah, like, I was so moved by it. And, like, I could tell that these concepts that were being talked about were very profound. And, like, I didn't know anything about, like, environmental issues or whatever. But, like, I think I always just kind of knew where I stood on that stuff. Anyway, even as a kid. And I was like, yeah, like, forest's awesome. Wolf, cool. Love that shit. <laughs> animals are awesome maybe we don't maybe we don't kill them i don't know and like Mm -hmm. how it kind of has a tragic ending like that stuff just really affected me and i that was just stuff you don't there's not tragic ending i mean like lion king the dad dies and that's sad you know Mm -hmm. but they win at the end like that's kind of the vibe and i was just like this all feels so intense and maybe Mm -hmm. it was more like i want to see the adult stuff even though i'm not yet and i'm like i'm ready like i'm an adult but i'm 13 or whatever yeah it might have been something like that but they were just, like, so magical in ways that the stuff that I grew up watching wasn't. Yeah, oh. fan, like, high fantasy. Yeah. Concepts that, like, I, f- I feel like a executive in the U.S. would be like, no, no, people can't handle that. You know, yeah. you, you couldn't pitch a high fantasy thing like Princess Mononoke. It would just, it wouldn't get made. Because it yeah, would nobody seem would too understand intense. It. Yeah. And we love to puzzle out, like, there's a scene in Princess Mononoke where... Ashitaka is like gravely injured and San who's like Princess Mononoke is feeding him she's like chewing up beef jerky oh yeah him, like out of her mm-hmm. mouth and my sister and I were like what does that mean like what's going on there mm-hmm. what is mm, like what does this mean about her character like we were already trying to be like this fucking means something important about these characters and their relationship because they were not friends at that point mm-hmm. and like and it was all like so advanced for us and like he cries when she does mm-hmm. that he just like cries a single tear and like makes no noise and doesn't say anything and we were just like what does that mean and 
I like nothing about Aladdin was like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what's going on in like the inner machinations of like Aladdin's mind. It's like, no, I get it. Yeah, there's not, there was nothing there. <laughs> yeah. So there, it was just like all these profound adult mysteries that we couldn't understand, but we're very intrigued by. Ooh, spe yeah. Speaking of profound adult mysteries. Oh, <laughs> is it time to. Cartoon Feelings Night. <laughs> is it time, time to get into the, the story of Tokyo Godfathers? Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> We open on a nativity scene, which, for those who don't know, is the baby Jesus at all. Farm animals, people, and there's a plastic baby. And in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> foreshadowing for the real baby that will show up. Uh, and in the audience, we have two of our main characters, Gein and Hana, homeless people who are friends. I'm not looking at Ira for confirmation. Oh, I think we'll find out over Anne. the... I guess we'll, we'll find, find out. out. Uh, and they're there ostensibly to get a little companionship from just being around people and get something to eat. You and don't see. often see stories open at a place like this. No. In fact, this is the only time <laughs> I think that it's happened. Historically. To me. <laughs> um, I go for our blog post with nativity scenes in movies. <laughs> The, the listicle. <laughs> it's funny how heavy the Christmas vibes are just right at the beginning of this movie because it really sets up. Like, Jess, when you saw this in the theater, was it Christmas time? I don't remember. I don't remember when it came out. Uh, okay. Never mind. January 16th, 2004. So <laughs> yeah, kind yeah. of like post Christmas. And there are like. And this does actually feel like this comes up in like a New Year's yeah. type. I don't know. There's sort of a New Year's energy to this movie. Also. Yeah, that's so what I was going like to say between. is it feels like even though we have like the heavy Christmas right in the beginning, there's hmm. I feel like there's more yeah. mention of like New Year's than there is of Christmas. Yeah, actually, that's a great point because it, it does. It, it has a coziness, but it doesn't have that Christmas spirit yet. Yeah, totally has just that New Year's spirit. Yeah, there's no scene of like a giant Christmas tree where they all go and be like, at least we have each other. <laughs> right. Which is like endemic to christmas movies i feel okay so we get this whole amassment of um tokyo's homeless and they are they're all pretty bummed it uh so i i i don't know if either of you know this but i i worked in like a i guess it was a food pantry for like three years and there was an an annex to the building and there was an art classroom and i was like the assistant to a nun art teacher and Two days a week for like four hours, I would go and assist her with like an art class that was open to anybody that used the food pantry. And it was just funny how this this rang true in that like nobody's here to hear the, <laughs> hear the thing. Everybody's like waiting for the food or whatever they want to get out of this situation. And then they are on their way and maybe they're absorbing something. Uh, but I just thought um, just so much of this movie feels – like this is what it might be like even though i would never say it really was because i don't know this life but uh i don't know this is just a great like authentic feeling opening yeah and it's a great introduction to these two characters too because it's like yeah immediately you can see who they are hannah is like totally into it you know she's just like nodding along she's she really wants to like she's so like passionate and sweet and she just is like wants to feel something and and Gin is just like try desperately trying to not feel anything, <laughs> and like yeah, he's just the guy's asleep. just like it sucks to like not have a place to belong, and he's like I heard that like yeah. that's his energy. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we we get these two great characters, and they're just so at odds with each other, even though they seem completely trapped together. <laughs> it's interesting that they're not sitting next to each other, though. I know, like he's behind her. Mm. And so they have that, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not, like, together, but, like, they totally are. Right. I was like, why are you sitting next to each oh, other? Oh, you know what? That kind of begs the question. Like, were they really spending as much time as it seems before they found this baby? Or yeah. did the baby really just bring them all together? And I kind of like that it's not that clear about it. Because yeah. they don't – it seems like they're living right. in the same place. Yeah. They at least, you know, travel around together, right? Because they go to that site to, like, find the, the books – for yeah, Miyuka they're obviously spending together. a lot of mm -hmm. time together. 
This uh, God damn, this movie is so, you know, there's like when you read about fucking filmmaking, like someone like Francis Ford Coppola is like the magic is in the editing. But it's actually like this Francis. movie is edited so wet. Like it's, I get so excited watching this movie the way the way we, we like come out of the church. We, we get these little character beats. Then they find that baby and we cut to the title card like. I oh, love, yeah, yeah. I love like a sudden title card in that way. And it's, it's delivered a, on like the side of a truck yeah. too. It's just like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Okay, so we get we get this amazing setup and what there there's so there's so many like layers of things going on. There's like all the emotional stakes of everybody. You just have like instant empathy for these characters because of their situation. But then you're set up with this great mystery because you get the baby. It's cute. Baby needs to find a home and I'm not going to rest until I see it happen. And then you get the key. You get like the clue. And it's like, oh, we're just in a fucking mystery. Yeah, also. I love that. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like um, Miyuku's like little moment of, oh, and then like quick cut because yes. we remember the key exists, you know, and then the next shot is them like at the storage locker opening it up because it's just like, it's such a great little quick cut where they're like, well, what are we going to do? Like, try and find out where she lives? And then it's just like, oh. yeah. she doesn't even say the key. It's just like, we know because we've been paying attention <laughs> right. that they're now going to find out what this key opens. Everything's kind of just moving at the right pace where you're, it's not like you're struggling to keep up. Like, I feel like it's kind of frenetic. Like, this could be a, this would be like a goddamn season of television, this storyline. It would go on for mm. like nine hours, but they so they don't have to remind you of things as much, which I just think is like always so cool. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I actually missed a part the first time I watched it. It's when Hana is like, she's running after them. They've been separated. I won't even say the details because, you know, this movie has a lot of that. Uh, and she like stops and she's really like out of breath and she coughs up blood on a pipe basically. And, oh, it goes yeah. by and it's like foreshadowing. She just she collapses basically from exhaustion, I guess. And all like all this stuff and, that's closer to the end of the movie, but it's such a fleeting moment. And um, that part confused me because I had looked away for like a minute <laughs> at that mm. section. But I love that. Like, I'm not like, oh, man, like uh, I looked away for a minute. And I missed that thing. It's like, that's how it should be, because then it's like, keep watching, you know, yeah. like stuff, mm -hmm. the stuff mm -hmm. that is happening actually matters. It's not just random bullshit. And that's really rewarding. <laughs> Everything you hear somebody say is kind of working on like multiple levels, especially in this like first act where it's being set up. So they they find the baby and they all like have a point of view of what should be done with the baby. And then little things they say tell you about their own story that you're going to get later. Like um, Miyuki says she like instantly knows that the cops are going to have like an APB out on this. Mm -hmm. Like that's her go to like, oh, I, I know how the police forks work force works and you're like later you find out like her dad she said everybody like plants these little seeds of like mm. what the the situation they're gonna inevitably find themselves back in because they all think they're done with those parts of their lives but tonight it's all it's all coming back yeah when it's <laughs> through so fucking natural. coincidence after coincidence i was like i like that he yeah the, um I think it's Hana that comes up with naming the kid Kyoko, the baby, and he's like, ugh, ew. <laughs> and you just think it's because he's a crotchety asshole because that's, like, his energy so far in the movie. And really, it's because that's his daughter's name, and he, like, finds it super traumatic. Yeah. But, like, it's just it's very well done. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I think that you could watch the movie in a way that where you're not no. mm -hmm. noticing any of those things and still have a great fucking time. And because the storytelling is so clear, you know, you're, you're still having a wonderful time watching this movie, even if you're not picking up on all those little things. You know, so it's it's just like an added bonus for paying attention <laughs> and it makes the world feel so much more real. So now now we kind of move along. The journey has begun, right? We got to like this. This baby is really cute. It's got it's got a third eye. You notice that baby's got that, you know? Yeah, they can see stuff. I, I guess. guess we're yeah. like evoking some sort of like Hinduism a little bit. I don't know. I mean, religion's just coming at this movie <laughs> from left and right. I think you're, you might be religious, <laughs> Ira. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing patterns is all I can say. Uh, I'm seeing coincidences, serendipitous and Jesus Christ. And, <laughs> um, okay. And then we get what I found a very evocative shot of the, the, the Yakuza boss trapped under the car. I loved that. <laughs> oh, it's so yeah. good. <laughs> like, whoa. And he's like struggling. <laughs> 
it's so funny and it's so like i feel like this is something this movie does a lot is that there's so many moments of levity and like realness that the mm. humor right. surprises you every time like you yeah. never expect there to be a joke here suddenly it's just like <laughs> boom and here is the funniest thing you've ever seen this man is trapped under the under a car and he's struggling desperately to something keep it i off noticed watching this movie is like <laughs> busting out laughing like i laughed out loud so much yeah. during this and it was just like things would happen so fast that i'd be like ah! and then it was like over and i was just like it was really <laughs> cool like it felt rare <laughs> yeah that poor guy like mm -hmm. i didn't even realize that the realness that you're talking about like this just is a guy to me at first and then later when they're at like his fancy party mm -hmm. and people have guns and stuff i was like oh but i love that that's he doesn't show up and they're like you saved this guy and he's like really cool and then he's like oh you've done you've done a great service to me like blah 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 like something that fucking any like right yeah, a lot yeah. of like cart like animated movies would do that yeah and this is like he's just a guy like he's a mm. He's like a mob boss, but he's also just like a dude in this moment. And this is just like something that can happen to a guy. Yeah, And that's exactly. it. There's nothing more to it. Right. You you sort of like, you learn more about who he is. Well, like you learn his personality, at least this time of year, like in this moment. But then you see like the social structure that accumulates around him. Whereas like most like Western stories would start the other way. It's like, look at this amazing, like, Yakuza boss. Isn't he so cool? Look at all these people with guns. I feel like mm -hmm. if I was, I would love to have seen this as a kid and be introduced to the ideas of, like, violence existing in the world through something like this more than just seeing cool people with guns doing, like, crazy action stuff. It just seems like so, such a better way to, like, discover the world. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> through fiction. Um, it's it's just like every character we meet in this, it's so unique the way we meet them. It's like so much about what this story is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we get to the club you mentioned earlier, Caitlin. Seems like a great hang on a I love a club. A new year time of year season. And the club you are referring to, because there are multiple clubs. In oh, this that's movie, true. Is the mobby one. The fancy one, correct? Yeah, rented for a wedding. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the, the it's wedding. It's got like baby angels. Yes. Ooh, imagery, a motif, if you will. <laughs> and we haven't acknowledged this at all, but angels show up in this movie <laughs> about 17 gajillion times. Uh, it might be, uh, I don't know. Hard Time to will say. tell. Yeah, it's impossible to know if it's just a coincidence. <laughs> Uh, there's like marble pillars, you know, <laughs> elaborate staircases mm -hmm. and the dorkiest groom I've ever seen who apparently Guilt. is like a total jerk, but he looks like <laughs> a, like an eighties male model. Like, yeah. what is this guy in his like white suit and his like little hair? I don't know. Like he, I just, I didn't realize <laughs> that he was going to be such a jerk at first. Cause I was like, he looks kind of like a nice guy. <laughs> He's just like, I'm like, I'm the guy who's getting married. Okay, this is where I'm going to start getting confused. So that guy you're talking about, he is, is he the guy the daughter is going to marry? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So Jess, he's you like probably the owner know this of story. the club. Or... So... Yeah, I think he's the owner of the club. Okay, right. It is hard to keep track, though, honestly, which I don't fault this movie for, like, at all. There's a lot of characters and they go to a lot of places and that part of it is, like, that they think some people are someone and then it turns out they're not and yeah. that's like part of the plot so it's easy to kind of be like wait what oh all the little red hair and things are so perfect yeah it's really fun right and so she right he is their lead on mm -hmm. uh, right. sachiko the, yeah. the mm -hmm. lady at the end right so because he she worked at his club so he, that's why he knows her but he he like calls someone on the phone to ask about her and he's such a he's such a creep the way he talks about her. He's like it like says some very misogynistic stuff. Which is why we don't feel too bad when he gets shot twice. <laughs> That's true. Got him. <laughs> I something I, I do love is that all of the people who are or or at least a lot of the people who are like not homeless in this movie are shown to be way less moral people than the home mm. than our homeless protagonists. You know, so the, this club owner guy, he's like a real jerk uh, and just another person who has like mistreated this this lady that they're trying to find. Yeah. And like does not care, like totally mm -hmm. blase about it. Cool guy. And, Gets shot. Mm -hmm. and our, our main characters are like invested in this baby, which is the thing that's of bringing all this out of them. Right. And like it's just a clear line between like if you care about the baby, 
you're on the right track. Like there's, there's this idea that I don't know what I was watching that said this, but it's the idea that in a story characters with imagination win. So like, Hell if yes. you're, in, if you're in a horror, if you're in, <laughs> if you're in Jurassic park and you believe in the T-Rex, you will survive it. Cause you understand what it is and how it acts. But if you're the shitty lawyer, who's just like here for the money, but doesn't see, mm -hmm. doesn't have the imagination, you will die. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you will succeed if you believe in the story the director's trying to tell. It seems like a manipulative way to like, look at storytelling, but it's like, these people believe in this baby. And if you believe in the baby, you're going to make it. Wait, am I making a huge leap by, I feel Let's just like go. all the pieces are coming together, but when I ta say it out loud, it's going to sound really stupid. So I don't know. Is that kind of like the central thing about the Jesus metaphor, or like the, the Christian imagery? It's not about actually Christianity is like the real religion or whatever. It's not actually religious, but it's more about really believing in something and being like a pursuing the good. And then that kind of makes you on the right mm -hmm. path in the way that mm -hmm. like anybody who earnestly follows a religion with positive precepts is going to come out a better person regardless of if that religion is actually true or not. Because a lot of it is like angel imagery too in this baby. And like Hana is just the relentlessly optimistic one that honestly drives them taking yeah. care of this baby mm -hmm. for a lot of it. And she's just like, we just do. And like, God loves this baby. And like, God, you know, this baby's so lucky and da da da. And I'm just like being so cheerful and positive in a way that I find it absolutely infectious. Like, I think that just... That's maybe a, a point of the movie is oh, like totally. having yeah. that and pursuing that is ultimately what's going to bring you out in a better situation because you're, it's the secret. You're putting that positive energy out into the world and it's coming back to you, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Hana, Hana is definitely like the hero, the hero's journey, whatever of this, because even the director, like there's footage of um them doing like live action you know, scenes and then not, it's not like that it's rotoscope, but it's reference. And, um, the director is Hana in all those occasions. I love that. So I, I think he's like mo the, the character he's most curious about is this character. And therefore we get the most interesting stuff through them. I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a, a real main character, mm -hmm. but I do feel like Hannah is, um, like at least the driving force. I do think that, um, Empathy is obviously like a huge message for this movie. It's just like, just try to have empathy for the people around you and don't, don't just like write people off, you know, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, Seems weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems suspicious. <laughs> okay. So Miyuki and the baby are, they're held hostage, I guess, basically. And they're taken to the hitman's mm. wife's. Beautiful little cozy bedroom. <laughs> so cute. Like a little. It's so cute. I love that whole. Them just like hanging out is a really nice moment. Yeah. Oh, it's so lovely. Yeah. There's a there's a great little joke where when he's holding her hostage right before they get in the cab. Where she he's speaking Spanish and she, she has no idea what he's saying. So she just like speaks in English because she like knows a few English words. And she's just like. What is she, she says, thank she you very like, much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you guys are like at gunpoint. So He's good. like pleading with her, <laughs> and there's such like there's it's such good acting because her face is so desperate. She's just like, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> like <laughs> this is all I have to offer. <laughs> so yeah. we arrive. We we get the the boob shot that we talked about earlier. Well, there's more than one. That's true. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boob counter, cartoon feelings. We've never done that. <laughs> no, this is the first episode of that. <laughs> um, the bit. All right, we get this. We get this other baby, which is just like a great little extra detail for there to be this sort of like maternal moment, and then having Miyuki just like really observe. Like you can see, it's kind of like because this is a scene where we need to learn a little bit more about her because all these characters can't mm. like remain a mystery for much longer. But it's such a great way to kind of like slide in this backstory amidst like the immediacy of the plot and this kind of quieter moment without just like a whole. It's funny how ex I wouldn't ever call it exposition. It's more like it's I feel like sometimes I'm watching this as a play. The way characters talk, I'm like, 
I'm excusing any sort of over speaking because that's just sort of the way the story is being told. It's not like a crutch. Well, I don't think there's a lot of it either. There is some where it's like, ah, like this is your sister. That's not a lot, you know, but that's like the type of line we're talking about. Mm. But like, it's not as much or as like blatant. It's just the way that they talk to each other still feels pretty natural. Yeah. There's like reinforcement or or there's a character being like, that's so insane. Like they follow the beat by like understanding in their own way, which is I'm like totally fine with because I think it adds to sort of the slight camp of it, or I don't know if camp is the word, but there's like an exaggeration that's like joyous about this, where everybody's kind of always talking. <laughs> well, yeah, you do feel like like Hana as a character is like larger than life to me a little bit of just being like so happy, kind of, and like optimistic and kind of like loud. <laughs> it's not like people like that don't exist. It's just that that feels sort of like a play, yeah, to me, where. Like I'm very rarely in life are there actual situations where somebody's yelling at another person and that that just goes on for a very long time, especially in a public place. Yeah. Like movies love to do that where they're like, uh-huh. let me just lay out everything that's wrong with you. And I'm like, a lot of the time the other person either starts yelling at them or they leave. Sometimes it does happen. I have been berated in my life mm-hmm. for sure. It does happen. But like she's doing it all the time. Like yeah. that's her like you need to get your shit together energy in a way that's like that feels very Mm -hmm. like to the audience in a way yeah it's actually kind of nice when we split the group up because i just think that that adds some interest because like you can't wait for them to all get back together but but when we're here in the in this little bedroom we we meet some well we get the backstory and we meet angel i guess we don't really meet angel the cat yeah but that's this is like our first mm-hmm. little like kind of sad moment, I think. I, is this the moment that you? Uh... No, that's coming later. But there's the way the way she's talking about her cat is just sad. I agree. <laughs> just no, in general, you know. I was going to mention mm-hmm. this at the character mm-hmm. design stage mm-hmm. too, but it really mm-hmm. struck me that in her flat in Miyuki's flashbacks, she's like much like she's visibly overweight compared to how she is in the movie generally. And I don't know why. I think it's just this effect that a lot of movies have where somebody is a certain way and then they just always are that physically and they never yeah. change. Like, I always thought it was kind of funny that, um, I don't remember his name, but there's like Jon Snow's inept friend in the wall in like Game of Thrones or whatever. And they're like out there roaming the ice wilds and he just stays exactly as like proportion <laughs> as he was previously. Where right. the whole deal is like, oh, he had like a yeah. coddled life from like a wealthy family or whatever. And I'm like... He would definitely get, like, more hard-bodied, like, from the deprivation Mm -hmm. and the struggle, Mm -hmm. like, but they just, they're not going to change that, because why would they? Really, it just shows the effect of, like, she's been living on the street for six months, so you actually feel the impact Mm -hmm. of somebody who has actually done that, not somebody who was just like, I left home, and then Mm -hmm. I was exactly the same, and I didn't, like, I wasn't affected in any way, and it's just, like, no attention to it, like, called whatsoever, and it's just like, this is super nice, like a real person, actually. Mm. So we get we get it. This is this is one of these things that I probably, if I had been in the wrong mood and like maybe somebody had put this movie on when I was a kid, or not a kid, but like a twenty ish something, and I I wasn't ready to watch it. the The way the the kind of stabbing scene plays out now, I'm like enjoying it as it is, but it's. I wasn't used to, for a long time, this type of approach to dramatic beats because like the way the the dad is engaging with her, like he's still really mad. She's like unregretful. The mom's doing this. It's just also distinctly something that is not how you would treat a scene like this and like kind of like the tropes of Western storytelling. And I... uh... I feel like it's also very relatable because I would also stab my dad mm. if I thought he did something right. to my cat. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get why she's doing this. And she's like very visibly upset. And it feels like immediately understandable why mm. she ran away from home. And it, it feels immediately understandable that she is, that she regrets it. And then is, you know, kind of scared of herself or, or scared of what she did and, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's just, yeah, it doesn't feel like it's something that would usually be touched on. Did you hold, I, I have a question. Maybe I wasn't picking this up on the movie and I might be mishearing what you're saying. Do you think that she as a character through this movie, like is afraid of her violence? 
do, do you think there's like oh no i feel like i feel like she's ashamed of what she okay. did yeah i guess is what i feel like and and i feel like that comes through in her like crying about it and thinking about it kind of breaking down in the way she does about it she definitely feels like remorse and feels like she can't she's too ashamed to go home yeah. she doesn't feel like she can't go home it doesn't feel like she, she it feels like it's something she can't come back yeah from. i guess it, it's like a it's it's similar to Jin in a way but his his is like more a case of pride that and that's mm. that's like he's mm -hmm. distinctly a japanese character I, I don't know why i guess like a lot of japanese movies i i remember watching when i was younger you would get a guy like this who made some wrong moves with money. He took out a, a crazy loan because that's like so prominent in Japanese culture, like these kind of loan shark things, like the way people, like these high interest, like uh, uh, Yakuza loans, like this is a thing that I remember being in movies all the time. And he has, his pride is such that even though he could go home, he like chooses not to. It's just like so distinctly Japanese to me, like like guy Japanese culture and you see so many other males mm -hmm. in this movie that are on the verge of that like drunks that are still wearing business suits or something like in the convenience store mm -hmm. yeah anyway well and that's kind of the next scene is is isn't it is like um gin meeting the old right. man that is like a future version of him that wearing his clothes has the same bag <laughs> this i th that old man is so tragic but hilarious like his eyes don't align with <laughs> so funny yeah it's like one of the funniest moments in the movie it's so good i i bursted out laughing because i i did not remember that at all because it feels like such a somber moment like this this old guy is dying and and it's such a like oh gin is like helping like this is who gin is gonna be if he keeps you know fighting the people in his life who he has relationships with and he he doesn't just like let right. people love him. He's just going to be this lonely man dying on the street. And so it's like, it feels so somber. Like he's, he's taking care of him, his future self while he dies. And then he tries to close the old man's eyes as he dies. And his eyes just <laughs> pop back up. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> it's so good. It's like a perfect joke. <laughs> and then while you're enjoying the joke, he still also then just dies, right? Yeah. The yeah. Guy's <laughs> super dead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, now I'll really die. Okay. <laughs> so while all that goodness is going on, we're also introduced to the city as a character, like through the wind, right? Like we keep cutting to the the kind of wind windmills that are like mounted on the outside of Jin's home. Oh, mm -hmm. and the way they're kind of spinning as the old man is alive, but then when he's not, they're yeah, off. They it's like, yeah. Oh, here we are. Like maybe wind is going to help us out later. We'll see. Damn, that's a good point. I didn't notice that. That is a good observation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it's they're spinning as long as he's alive. But every because they flat they come back to it like you see it twice, and then when he leaves and fate and um, you know, runs into these like thuggy business dudes who. Um, I guess they're teens. The Wikipedia describes them as teenagers oh is it okay I, f I was getting more of yeah a, i saw them as yeah, teens okay yeah i was having more of a they were in their 20s type of like crappy like young business scumbags yeah i totally like finance bros mm. i yeah. can to totally see either that. way both whatever suck. the equivalent teens and... suck except when they're cool which yeah. is half the time and that but <laughs> business chance, any teen <laughs> post, post <-con> they definitely <laughs> seem like like affluent teens, right. like like shitty affluent yeah, teens. Absolutely. But, uh, the, the thing that made them feel like really teenage to me was the the one kid is like, he's he's just like putting on such a ridiculous like pastiche of like an action movie guy, like just not even taking seriously the fact that he's gonna beat the shit out of out again. He's just like making stupid noises and like pretending to be an action star as he like comes. <laughs> yeah. It's like they have ass. no awareness of what they're doing when like, yeah, obviously they know what they're doing, but like, they're just literally like no empathy there whatsoever. Like just, yeah, this is just, we're just screwing around like without like, any co complete yeah. casual cruelty. Right. Like yeah. Teens. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's really gross. And I, I always wonder with stuff like this, not to bring it into the real world, but it's like, is it a, a sense of like you you are ashamed that your world has like let people exist like this type of thing? I, I just always wonder like how this sort of like violence 
kind of like comes to be. <laughs> I always think about it as like there there are people who don't want to admit that there are people that just fall through the cracks and that this can just happen to people. Yeah. They they want to believe that these people are just lazy and they're making the city worse by being lazy and shitty and living in the park, you know, like they think it's they think that the homeless people are the ones who are like morally flawed because they're too lazy to get a job, but because the harder reality to face is that no, this just happens to people and it could happen to you. <laughs> right. Like you could just fall through the cracks like any of these homeless people have. Yeah. And they just don't have that empathy. So they're like, I feel bad about this. Therefore, the homeless people need to be punished. <laughs> it's just like so shitty and awful and callous. The the nice thing about the the insertion of like characters like this is we're so in the world of our three main characters. Like that that theme doesn't quite pop up. It's like these these thuggy kids are more just like comic relief and they're they're kind of like what yeah, so what happens next? I mean there's a reason there's kind of we tie this scene to Well, it's coming back to like we're not quite there yet, but like this is the part where they're still separated and like Hana goes back to her club. Right. Oh and yeah. And so yes. he gets that this is the funniest joke in the movie to me is when Gein gets the shit kicked out of by the teen. That's not the funny part. But he gets beat up by these like rabid <laughs> teens and then he's like in an alley and he's super poor and the um, there is this like woman from this club that they oh, end up right. going yes. to who's yeah, like in yeah, angel so garb and it's like and she's like what what do you want like my magic or an ambulance and he's like an ambulance and she's like that is so rude. Like, <laughs> And I was, I like screamed out loud at that part because I was just, it's, and then it's cut so it cuts fast, like, like, like on to the, the next thing. Beat, yeah. It's like, holy fuck, that's so funny. Exactly. Um, and that, then it turns out that that's the club that like Hana used to work at and is from. There we go. What a coincidence. So <laughs> well, weird. that's the use of like the thuggy kids. He needs to get beat up. So he has this funny beat with this angel and then mm. now we're at the club. So it all, it's like just this all cause and effect. Perfect thing. All right, so now we get Hana's backstory. So, like, speaking of characters that had, like, a different look in another time, like, when we flash to her, I, I don't know, glory days or whatever, but when she was, like, in top form on the stage. Love, yeah. Uh, it's just, like, it's got that perfect kind of haziness to it. There's, like, a softness, mm. I feel like, to the, the movie as a whole. Like, the line art isn't very harsh ever, um, other than, like, mm. certain... There's certain character moments when they're very in-your-face, but... This is just like her, like her blush, like her rouge on her face. Oh, she has beautiful <laughs> makeup. Yeah. She's cute. She's in like a sparkly mm -hmm. outfit singing a song. And then some mm -hmm. guy's a dick. And on, like the, those scenes just make me love her so much. I don't know. That's what mm -hmm. I'm very curious. I don't actually want to have this conversation, so I won't. But I'm curious what like a more conservative <laughs> we'll person's take would be just watching this movie and like mm -hmm. how they would evaluate this character because Hannah's like whole deal is she used to work at this club and she had a partner and the partner passed away in this total like freak accident. And, and that's what like put her out on the street essentially. And she mm -hmm. got, well, she didn't get fired, but she quit the job at the club because somebody like, you know, was like a shit heel to her and she just lost it and like attacked him. And it's kind of played for comedy in the flashback, mm -hmm. almost like very exaggerated. And she always has this like, I'm like so cute. My eyes are like sparkly or whatever. And then somebody's like mean to her and like the face just goes like, like super angie face like it's like hard mm -hmm, turn mm -hmm. uh, she's just like i was so ashamed after that like i couldn't come back and that's like why i didn't come here when i you know ended up being out on the street so i was like too embarrassed and you know it, i just felt so bad about that but to me that like that also is like such a sad thing and like i just really hate the idea of somebody watching this and being like yeah like this person kind of like brought this on themselves or like deserved that because like i I disagree. And like uh, you, cause you could easily interpret yeah. it that way. I think if you wanted to, especially because like you attacked this person, whatever, like that's such an easy way. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm just so angry because I'm like, yeah, but like she has a right to, to be respected as like an yeah. individual and not be harassed in her place of work and all of this other stuff. Yeah. And I, th like, that's a conversation again that I really just don't care to seek out, but I am curious because, um, I don't know. Han as a character is very interesting. And even the uh, game sometimes is like very misogynistic mm -hmm. about her situation and says some mm -hmm. like, kind of shitty stuff. And it's not really addressed because this movie just isn't that movie where it's going to be like, and here's what's good and what's bad morally. 
So it, it feels very complex. I, that's what's good about it too, is that I feel like it shows her standing up for herself. You know, her, it's not like she's just, she, she takes the insults that are thrown at her. You know, she stands up to people when they say shitty things to her. And I feel like you don't get queer or trans characters that are, have that much autonomy in a story. You know, usually it's like if somebody is, is mean to a queer or trans character, it's a very like sad and tragic moment. And the movie is like, no, we're going to let you hear what this person thinks about that. And they're going to stand up for themselves. And, and it's great. I do feel like this movie is like way ahead of its time because like trans characters were not in anything in 2003. Like they were not being talked about at all. So I think it was like incredibly ahead of its time. I do think that like if I, like my my one criticism is like if I had, if I had a trans friend who wanted to watch this who had like never seen it, I would be like some of some things yeah. in this movie might upset you because there are instances of like people saying shitty things to Hannah and I can imagine a trans person would not want to hear those things, you know, because they're upsetting and they're, you know, they could be triggering. So I think that like, that's my one criticism. I feel like there there could have been a moment of like Gin and Miyuki Miyuku standing up for hmm, Hannah, yeah. you know, uh, yelling at someone for 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 being cruel to her in that way. That that would have the been one, uh, yeah. nice. There's but, one um, instance that's not quite that, but I did like that the first time this happens, it's really early on. It's a first scene that Miyuki's in, and Miyuki calls her pops, at least in the sub version. I don't know. I didn't watch mm -hmm. the English um, dub, but. And Hannah's like, okay, like, you can tell me to eat shit, but, like, don't call me Pops. It gets really pissed off. Mm -hmm. And so Miyuki's mm -hmm. like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Granny. Like, and I was like, she's still being a little shit, like a shitty little teen, but she walks it back. And I was like, that's really mm -hmm. cute. Like, that's cute right. moment. Between yeah. Guys. Yeah, there's, there's like, a, with, with so much of their dialogue, they're, it seems like the intent is to try to play them as close to people that just say whatever the fuck is running through their brain. Like Jin, his, the mean things he says are the type of things someone like that would just blabber out loud. Cause they're, like, he's, he's trying like, to be a dick a lot of the time too. Yeah, like, right. He's being a crotchety jerk like, intentionally, but he's got like a curio. It's like an annoying curiosity too, where he's like, Look at the si look at the size of his or her. I don't even know how how he when he refers to Hana in which way, but it's like look at the size of their footprints or like little yeah, things. Like big feet. It's like he's mm -hmm. he. It's kind of like it feels like he's at a zoo a little bit. He's like very interesting, you know. It's just like so mm -hmm. insulting, but also you've I've seen that right. Like we've all seen like people yeah. talk to people that way. So it's just, I agree. It's like mm -hmm. such a fine line about like, what, what are you representing here? I like, do wonder you know, too. What do you want to say? I Which genuinely think people? generously, like the first thing is I think sometimes people include things like this just to be like, okay, people sometimes just are really dumb about certain things and like are shitty about certain things. And like every person has a weird, like has a side to them like that in some capacity um, or they're ignorant. But also I wonder, like a lot of how these characters behave and interact with each other is representative of their problems and like their, the tendencies that they have that have like led to them being in the situation in life. And his whole deal is like pushing people away and being like, oh, like, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like out on my own because mm -hmm. that's like what my deal needs to be. And I'm, you know, ashamed of my actions, blah, blah, blah. And like, he's not the kind of person that's just going to be affectionate. It's like, he's mm -hmm. like the generic dad of the group. Where he's like, I actually don't care about you. Like, I, and we're not friends. But, like, he definitely does. And I wonder if it's part of that where he's like, yeah, I'm going to be a yeah. shit about this. Like, I'm going to say mean stuff because, like, we're not actually close. But, yeah. like, actually we are. And we're basically in a marriage. <laughs> like, he definitely, yeah. like, hates himself a lot. Well, and you can feel that. Yeah. And is yeah. taking it out. Yeah, totally. Him. I feel like that that kind of reactionary element of a character, it's, like, so crucial because that's how you – like really explore what a character might do. Like when, when you're asking, I would actually love, I'm not going to run this experiment, like, but showing like some like fearful conservative, a movie like this, because I'm like, I would love to believe they would invest in these characters. Cause like a good story is a good fucking story. Like, and I, I feel like so much hate is just based around like how some shitty media is portraying like this extremely flat version of a type of person. So it's like easy to just say they represent this, but this movie is like mm -hmm. working hard, not hitting it perfectly, but, 
but trying to like teach you how to understand people that aren't you right a little bit yeah for sure yeah it's like totally about the empathy and i just i think like i i was reading about how uh, queer people and trans people feel about hannah and like overwhelmingly people love hannah she's like great. people just love her because she's such a positive character she's just like and she's like not she's she mm. she doesn't have shitty motives you know her motivations are so um like pure and she just wants like even when she talks about the reasons for why she's doing what she's doing you know she's she was a foundling you know she grew up on the street she wants to know she wants to confront a parent that would have abandoned their kid the way that she was abandoned you know and it's just like such a pure intention that she has and it's like yeah, I I would love to talk to someone who Honestly, hates Hannah. Yeah. How can anyone There's hate no Hannah? Way. It's <laughs> don't contact us if you feel this way. We don't want to hear mm -hmm. it. <laughs> this, this is a type of uh, like the um, it's like it's interesting how the way it uses her. You know, we we begin we're introduced to her through her reaction to like religious iconography and representation, and then that really that moment like fuels her for the rest of this story in a way it's like she is charged up by um seeing that like plastic nativity baby it, and then she runs on that energy through the rest mm -hmm. of the movie and is like the hero at the end it's just such like a interesting and mm -hmm. i think really cool way to use religion because like you know i was saying like the um the the food pantry i worked at like these people you know the i would meet people that really had nothing and being able to have, not all of them did, but like you could take religion and cherish it as like a thing of value. And you could, when you, you weren't able mm -hmm. to like even mm -hmm. buy your own food or clothing, like you weren't having representation outside of like the things you were just being gifted in this space. And it totally makes sense that a character like who has nothing but their faith and whatever, however deep that faith goes, who knows, maybe she like picked this up a week ago, but it's like so important because it's like, Billion and emptiness. It's just so like, it's so complicated <laughs> for like a <laughs> ninety-minute movie, uh, and like dip, just kind of brushed over in a lot yeah. of ways, right? Like I can read that; somebody else might not. But it's all it can be there if you want it to be. Um, it's nice. And I do feel like she's also really driven by like, yeah, just wanting to be a mom. Like she just loves the idea of being like a good mother. And you know, because her mother left her, and it's just such a like. Feels like such a genuine uh, driving force for her character. So during the, uh, so we're at the Angel Tower, of course, is what this um, <laughs> this club is called. Of course, <laughs> we're wondering. Um, so Weird. now we we didn't really talk about this. I don't think uh, we've talked about so many things. So Hannah tells her little story about uh, her lover Ken dying, slipping on a bar of soap. Mm -hmm. Terrible way to go, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. But... Mm -hmm. Hasn't happened yet to me. <laughs> it could. Oh, wow. <laughs> yet. Fingers crossed. Easily. <laughs> I, I think th the scene where Hannah like arrives at the club and oh, yeah. her mom opens the door, her, 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 her found family mom, her, her queer family mom. It's so, <laughs> this scene like made me cry so much and I didn't just expect it. And I didn't, like remember crying this much when I saw it the first time but um it's so sweet because Hannah is like fully expecting for a grudge to be held against her because you know she like she took off after she beat up this shitty customer and she figured that no one was going to forgive her and she's like uh, you know she's saying like oh I'm so sorry to come here to come to you now but we just really need help there's nowhere else to go and her her mom is just like happy to see her just so happy to see her and it's so sweet it's just like yeah. The nicest moment. I love the <laughs> scenes in the club. Yeah. It's the, uh, the energy there is mm -hmm. not what you would expect. And it's something like a live action movie would treat totally differently like that. Yeah. She opens the door and she looks and they're so different in height. And then she, she jumps up on her. It's like, you mm, just wouldn't so have cute. that in anything but a cartoon. Like <laughs> you can't achieve that sort of joy <laughs> in any other way. I don't think mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. it's good. It's a good feeling. Cartoons. Cartoon comma. feeling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at this point, do we, uh, we've got a, a, a taste of everybody's backstory. Have we got to know Jin yet by the time we leave the club? I feel like we, 
He no. said a couple things. Like, we haven't really... His he's lied. big reveal... Because we think that we found out about him, and I can't remember when it happened, but he told the story about, like, oh, my daughter died, and then my wife, like, totally died, and I was a bicycle racer, and I, right. like, <laughs> we, uh, like, lost all my money, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Like, and then we don't actually find out the truth of his situation until pretty close to the end, and it's when yeah. Hannah goes to the hospital. And by coincidence... Whoa. His daughter, I know, right? His daughter is a nurse there. And <laughs> they recognize it's each true. other on account of that they know each other from being related. And then he tells the story. <laughs> I, he does, like, slip up at one at an earlier point in the movie, but um, the other characters don't find out about it. Because he does slip up, I think, at one point and say, like, uh, I think it's about, like, the mob boss. Or the the, mm -hmm. the guy who's marrying the mob boss's daughter. He says something like, if it wasn't for this asshole, like, yeah, still yeah, be right. so that does happen. Because Hannah's like, oh, she's, 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 your daughter's live? Like, they have, like, a little bit of that conversation. Right, right. Because we, we, when he's telling that story, you're almost convinced because it also flashes to his version of that story, right? Yeah, Don't you we see get a him shot being of him a bicycle like... racer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're like, okay, I guess that's <laughs> yeah, true. This is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm real willing to believe it because it, it's like a bad version of this. You would feel misled or duped by that magic of like, oh, you thought it was this, but it was all a dream or what the fuck ever someone wants to do to you. But it's like the way this slides in and out of misinformation and real information is actually the way kind of people talk about themselves sometimes. Yeah, like, 100%. Right? Like sometimes if you don't know somebody mm. or you want to be something else, like here's an opportunity to be whoever you want to be. Yeah, and like, why would he be honest about it? Yeah. But when you meet people, you don't necessarily be like, oh, by the way, here's my dark backstory. Right. <laughs> Generally, that doesn't come out like first thing. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense. But then I love, that's like, they have the married couple fight where he's confessing all of this stuff, like basically to his daughter and Hannah's like, what the f actual fuck? Do you have any idea the stuff that he's yeah. been telling us? <laughs> like, you should be ashamed of yourself. And like the facial expressions at this part are amazing. Like... Her face takes up like 70% of the right. frame and she's like livid and it's just tearing him a new one in front of his daughter. It's a great scene and it, it does feel real. It's like, you some bitch, like you've been yeah. telling me this and this and this and like, oh, no, 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 no. And actually you're this guy. Like you're pathetic. We're out. Bye. But in a way where it's like, you still like really care about this person. You know, I don't know. There's something that starts to like emerge mm. thematically through mm -hmm. this. Like once once we bring in uh, the 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 fake mom, Sichigo, right? Um, si yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like her her thing. There's mm -hmm. this um, wanting to be born anew, like to have the chance to start over. Like she's kind of personifies that. But then like thinking back, it's like oh, gee, all these characters are sort of like looking for a clean slate, which is isn't like a thing you can really achieve. But I don't know. It's just like. Mm -hmm. especially I, anybody feels like this but i feel like it's so clear with like people that make art like these ideas of like i make art because i'm trying to figure out who i am and when you look at my art do you see me do you see me there <laughs> am i there well, who am i like there's just you want so much for people to like get you through like the things like the way you conduct your work i i feel like that that theme is just sort of like bubbling under the surface of this whole movie and it comes out very dramatically in one moment later because it's like a great just sort of like tragic moment for the mom the fake mom but uh i i never really thought of it being like kind of present in all the characters but it's kind of there i'll allow it okay we'll move on then <laughs> your interpretation is valid <laughs> okay so now we find now we uh the house has been torn down. Yes. Tragic for that house. Ah, uh, yes. That the house that that the that woman they're looking for. That was another part that I thought was inexplicably right. yeah, funny. Yeah. I don't know if it's supposed to be a joke, but they have the key, <laughs> and he like, yes, they're standing in like the empty hole of the like living room or whatever, and right. then he goes outside and opens the door, and he's like, "Honey, I'm home." <laughs> And then the door falls over, and I was just like, "What a great touch!" That I had no reason to include, but it's really funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so good. And the way he like silently does it too. It's just like Yeah, this is the house. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> like the joke is like how mundane all this tragedy is in the city. It's like oh, just yeah. get it, here's one of a million things that suck mm -hmm. about being, <laughs> being homeless in Tokyo. 
<laughs> um, okay, so like mystery plot wise, this is great because now we kind of like hit this dead end because you're like, damn it, I thought we were going to get an answer. Nope, just a no, hole like, in the ground. They could, and like no leads. Right. Yeah, they're kind of stuck. It's like that. Um, if you're planning a, a mystery story, this is exactly where this beat goes. But now we learn. We also learn. So we we learn about two new characters. We learn. I I'm going to say her name wrong again. I'm trying to avoid it. How do I say it? Sachiko. I think it's Sachiko. Sachi- yeah. Sachiko. And her husband. Does he get a name? Uh, I don't recall. The, uh, the gambling alcoholic? Yeah, I don't okay. know either. He's I don't a remember gambling his name. alcoholic. Yeah. He can be one dimensional. We have too many rich characters here. He's just going to have to That's fit true. Yeah, like, I don't care. <laughs> All right. So now we hit that dead end. Now we arrive at the store. So we're sort of like, we're, we're seeing a little bit of how the, the, the rest of the world looks at them a little bit here, I believe. Are we? No. They fight. <laughs> They're sitting on the bench. The clerk. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to do something that probably I don't even need to do. We've which skipped is all this... over the place, too. This movie, I mean. I feel like we're at, we're on track. Are we not in the, are we not in the convenience keep... store? No, I don't. Keep going and we'll figure it out. Because I think that might be before the hospital. But then they go to the convenience store and they do have a fight and they separate. Um, right and we, again there's a lot of stuff that uh, happens I don't, in this i don't remember why why did they, why do they separate um, okay so well I, re- I remember distinctly the clerk is not that we would need to recall every beat but it just sort of struck me and that we see the way the clerk is like responding to them because it's that kind of loitering you know like that that sort of like Mm-hmm. A homeless thing where you're like that person has just been walking around this block for hours like is that what it is to have like nowhere to get you know these things you like notice as you're kind of like on your way home or to work so they're like loitering basically in this convenience store taking up the bench and the clerk calls them out on it he claims it's like not for the reason that they're gross and smell but it's like other people want to sit and then like a drunk business dude just like just accosts them. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's got such a great look. I need to go through this whole movie and take every s- screenshot of every frame of every like character pose because mm-hmm. e- everything just looks so interesting. <laughs> I, it's wild how like the movie can be both super realistic and Looney Tunes at the same time because like yeah. – there's so much realism and it feels so rich and but then like there's also this like looney tunes like com- completely amazing animation at certain moments like that drunk guy is just like all over the place <laughs> it's great it's like very expressive <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> okay so I, there's a little bit of a reason for that i came across so the I, now i can't find this piece of information the story of my life and the story of me on this show which is why it's free but the <laughs> the creative director i believe of this film is like an iconic not iconic to me apparently studio ghibli person and they oh, were they yes. were given some real free reign with some of this squash stretchness of this movie mm. so there's certain scenes we'll get there like maybe my favorite moment in the movie is like hana's monologue Kenichi to konishi there you go say that again Kenichi konishi good so audience remember <laughs> that that way when i miss say it or just avoid it altogether you you'll dead. know you my can neighbors just... the yamadas <laughs> yes ah. okay so certain scenes are like the monologue, the Hana monologue, he did all the fr- all the in-betweens and all the keyframes for that. That's why that, that scene just sort of like really cool. starts to radiate with this energy. And you're like, oh, my God, what is going on? This yeah. character is just like an elastic, emotional ball of energy. It's because that, that Kono just was like, or not Kono, Ka- Konishi. <laughs> Konichi, Konishi. Can you just dub in me saying that every time? <laughs> <laughs> so the director was just like, do it, like, do your thing. And that will be this scene of the movie. It'd be like giving your cinematographer just like free reign. It's like, you direct this scene, like, see where, see That's where it goes. That's an animator's dream though, um, honestly. I think that would kick ass if somebody was like, hey, just go mm. nuts on this particular moment. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's part of what makes this like collaboration unique. It's like the the movie just sort of blows out of proportion in weird ways that, Weird in like a great way in that they draw your attention and like become extremely memorable. But I, I think that's a bit of the cause of it, which is cool and a lesson that should be learned by like 
over controlling directors. Amen. I did. I'm so glad you said that because I was like, maybe I won't say this, but I just want to quickly bring up how we bitch constantly. Well, I bitch constantly on this show about auteurship and how it's fake and whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. People who are make movies and are big jerks about it shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Period. Mm-hmm. But I almost feel bad because a lot of the mo- like us talking about this, we're like talking about Satoshi Kon and his involvement. But like, he also seems like a really smart collaborator. Yeah, I think that's the key. Because here. like this is mm-hmm, co-written mm-hmm. by her name is Keiko Nobumoto, who did um, Cowboy Bebop and Wolf's mm-hmm. Rain, and then Kenichi Konishi. It's like he knows who to work with, and then he lets them do their stuff. That's good. Like that is nice, and I kind of just yet another like Caitlin moment of complaining about like i wish it was always more apparent the other like other people's involvement and contributions yeah. to stuff because mm-hmm. you know. and it, it makes like the story of the movie s- sounds so appealing it's like this this director and in their team like went on a journey to like find these characters there's all this like research obviously that went into like understanding what these people should be like and you know, where they're coming from, like what the world is like, all these like little corners, like these these hidden corners of Tokyo that it's like the way Tokyo is represented. It, it's it's kind of loving in a really distinct way. It's like we really want to show you what Tokyo is like and you just need to love it as what it really is. Like it's not trying to paint this perfect picture of anything. Uh, and that to me, like makes it way more mm-hmm. appealing as a place yeah uh so good job animation team <laughs> uh, you guys did it it de- it definitely reminds me of this there's a show called midnight diner on netflix it's fantastic it's a japanese show but it, it's it feels like it has a very similar vibe where it's just trying to show like what happens in the middle of the night in tokyo mm. and it's like just like very diverse stories of like different kinds of people there are like queer characters in it too. And it's just like, it's, it's super, also super empathetic and like sweet and feels really like rich and thoughtful. But I, I think that to what Caitlin was saying, that the, the comedic acting is like, people definitely don't talk about that enough for animated movies because there's such amazing comedic acting in this movie. And that's just like all some amazing animator, you know, uh, who should definitely win an Oscar yeah. <laughs> because there's just so many amazing expressions and things happening that don't ever get talked about. Right. It's like the things we champion, like the nine old men at Disney for it's like what makes like Snow White so perfect is like the way those seven dwarves are like so expressive, right? Like the pursuit of like tr- this like character through a drawing is like what all of this needs to to always be about and this movie is like so much in the in the spirit of that type of approach i'm ready to climb up on my soapbox and hopefully i don't slip on it and die but sure. i'll just quickly <laughs> i mean just like you're like they should win oscars for this it's like this is a specialized like elite skill that not everybody can do and like why do people mm-hmm. diminish it so much that's it that's all i'm saying because mm-hmm, it's slippery mm-hmm. soapbox but it just baffles my mind that people can be so condescending about animation when it's like, do you have any idea? People have to literally devote their entire lives to this to be able to do it so well. To be able to do it mm-hmm. badly, people have to do that. Like, how dare you? Like, it's just, yeah, <laughs> it's a whole thing. It's fine. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, we were talking about like literacy with like storytelling stuff. I feel like it's a little of that. It's like, if you don't know how to read an animated movie, like you don't know how to really understand what it's doing in the, in all the ways it is doing things. Right. Like in this. Yeah. Yeah. Like it really it just becomes like it. a thing yeah. that is yeah. like a, a product that is dismissed on like so many levels other than like, inter- right. It's like, you know, put it on while your kid is like doing something or, Right. I think I think so many people don't know what goes into it, how like grueling and intense it is and how how much you have to know <laughs> to yeah, even be bad at it is like insane. And uh, and it's like it's kind of like when you see um a crazy right. stunt in a yeah. movie, but you just assume yeah. that it's CG cuz you cuz you don't know. You don't know that it's like uh like the, somebody did this actual real 
say they jumped off a building they actually did this you just assume it's cg and i think it's it's like that it's that yeah. people just don't understand what goes into it all right let's catch up with our our new friends here so hana collapses foreshadowed by a little like blood on in the on the pipe did you say yeah that was yeah, like a, on in an earlier scene yeah so now she's uh now we're in the hospital and uh jin is also in the hospital and miyuki's there and <laughs> The gang is all here. Now, okay, somebody, let's go. (laughs) What I remember about this scene, which is This is where we got off track a little bit because I talked about this part because of the argument. And then we went back to the convenience store. So they were only in the convenience store once. But now we're back here. And this is where they have the fight where Hana blows up at Gin for, like, having his, you know, bullshit, like, sob story thing. And then that's when they separate because she's like, we're going like, come on, right, me. Right. You're like, we're out. And they go off kind of together. And that's when they run into Sachiko. So where's the beat where um, they have to pay for their hospital visit and he has to spend his like 30,000 yen? That's right. That's when he meets his daughter when he runs into his daughter because she's oh, actually right. in the yeah, window okay. like behind the counter. Yes. And he's like handing the money over and then they look up and like lock eyes and they have their moment. That's one of those, like, I want to know how much the money these characters have moments that really scratched an itch for me, this scene. Because I'm yeah. like, that's all they have. And it's, like, crumpled, like, Pee Wee Herman style, like, money, where it's just, like, set on the counter. It's just a scene I think about a lot. Like, <laughs> I just like seeing characters transfer <laughs> money <laughs> across the I love money. <laughs> Capitalism is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, remarks, religion and money. Loves but in just like Can't such a simple way, it. like you feel so bad for them. They're, it's so it's so much like one like an, a step back because now that well, yeah, was, and he, he was gonna buy wasn't he gonna buy her something? Yeah, he was gonna that? give he it to like her. This, like he was saving it up to give it to her. Yeah. He felt so bad, and then it like it this hospital bill wipes it all out. Yeah, and it's just what a coincidence that it's almost the same amount. <laughs> Super weird. <laughs> Uh, this was so bizarre. Yeah, super coincidence. <laughs> it is. It is one of these moments with the movie where I was like, "Hang on." I thought that too. I was like, right. "What? They have to pay a bill?" <laughs> yeah. I, I thought like, it was just us. Yeah, I was like, but "I was like, like, having do not know it." Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> right. that's they, crazy." They yeah. clear that up for like the Western audience. Like, Here's how it'll be. Okay. Dealt okay. With. okay. <laughs> Wild right. times. So now we finally make, meet uh, Sachiko on the bridge. Yep. So they're what just what a coincidence that they're out there at the same time <laughs> as she's trying to kill herself off the bridge. Right, and they're just like walking by, and you see like this character in the background, sort of <laughs> like climbing up on the. Yeah, the... it happens so casually. <laughs> and then they pa- yes, and they because they pass such a good shot. It's, yeah, it's just it's just right where they're you, you as the viewer, you're like. What is? What did I just see? How, we're, are we not going to address that? And then they they look back out of frame, um, which is so yeah. good. Uh, and then they go back and they grab her just in time. Yeah, I'm trying to skip back, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get there in time because boy, there's so much going on in this film. But yeah. she, like, they're she, like having an impassioned conversation about something, and then that right. happens, and they're just like, "What?" Like, and then they just stop every. And it's another thing that makes me love Hana because she's just like, "Don't do it! Like, do not do this!" And I'm just like. What an amazing yeah. person. <laughs> she's very romantic. She feels like a very romantic person that she just doesn't, even though she's, you know, in a dire situation, she just seems like she's still very much in love with life and, and you know, going to en- enjoy her, enjoy it, you know. Yeah, like she's and not doesn't like, want other God, people like, to I end there. I hate theirs. that I'm in the situation I'm in. It's just like, yeah. I'm mad at other people for not appreciating the good situations they have. Cause she's like, how dare you like abandon this mm-hmm. baby? Like, what is, what are you even thinking? Like, get your shit together. She yeah, talks about yeah. earlier that that's like throwing love into the trash. And I was just like, Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> God, mm-hmm. what a perfect person. Anyway. And so Chico, when, when she comes into the story, it's a real, she's a real black hole. Yeah. Like it's that harsh, but true. All her like little beats and the lighting changes. She's, I feel like she's very blue. Like it's a very cold approach yeah. to a, a character. It's like she's not even. She's barely even a character. I feel like in a lot of ways, like she's sort of just this, not an antagonistic force exactly, but sort of like this bitter, 
uh, reality, a story gone wrong. <laughs> she really feels, yeah, yeah. She, she's like truly hit rock bottom. She's like so desperate. It's like, like throughout the course of the movie, we've been shown little snippets of her life and like what has happened to her as they're trying to find her, you know? And so like she got pregnant. We know that then she, that she then lost the baby. We know that her, her husband racked up a bunch of debts and that she had to work to pay off his debts at this club. And we know that she like got plastic surgery so that she could make more money at the club. And it just, she just feels like someone who has been tossed around so completely that she has just hit complete rock bottom. And, you know, mm. we think that our main characters are like rock bottom, but like this, this person has really like been kicked around by anyone in her life who cared about her. And she's just like got nothing left. And so she really feels like desperate and, and not, not no, even really yeah, right. Like there are parts conscious. Um, she's just mostly like later when like, she does not have the light in her eyes reflected. Like that's something that I really noticed is that like, generally in animation uh, in, in live action you know people wow. like lights reflect in our eyes and that's like a big part of just something that we notice without really thinking about it mm. and she is like the one character in this movie that in several scenes when she's looking really like mm. dejected and lost like has no light reflection in her eyes there is a there's a scene um there's like a transitional moment when um they they after they give the baby to her you see her walk off mm -hmm. and and gin is at the her husband's apartment because gin is following through this lead going to the husband's apartment and he's talking to the husband and so the husband is narrating as we watch the woman walk away with the baby and we don't know that she's not the mother at this point but like we see her walk down this alleyway and right as she walks down this alleyway she becomes like a dark silhouette and right at that moment is like when he's narrating that she's not actually the mother, that she stole the baby from a maternity ward. And it's just mm -hmm. like such a good visual metaphor of how like this, this woman is like totally lost. Like she's just completely gone to a dark place. It's like the villain reveal. Yeah. It's like you were the bad guy all along because from here yeah. on out, like this truth just turn, turns the last act of the movie on, right? Like now we're in the chase scene and now yeah, everybody's superpowers thing. are coming out. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. like we're doing every it's just so it's so good but it's also yeah. <laughs> like the way you describe it it's so like subtle it's not really like in your face it's all kind of happening as she like drifts off the screen and you have to like realize it yourself because i think the movie still has empathy for her like the movie is like still definitely has compassion for this woman like it's the movie isn't painting her as like a super villain or anything it's just that like she's definitely the one doing the bad thing that needs to be stopped that someone needs to intervene you know yeah that's the word like, she's walking away and you're like no, oh my god because, it's like, all on now they literally yeah. just had her you know yeah. and so it's just like but like it's tough right it's mm -hmm. like two two stories are colliding there's like the movie we've been watching and then there's this other tragic movie that just like runs into it and like that character is just so sad because you don't really like you know her story but we you feel bad that you haven't like been with her or something you're like maybe as a viewer i could have stepped in and <laughs> helped but no it's too, <laughs> it's too late she's sort of just on this like tragic uh path that like is just not not going to really be intercepted and um, everything you see of her is like these old photos where they look really happy yeah. like her and her husband and they're in front of their house and everything looks fine and the reality of it is like her husband's a deadbeat in a trash filled apartment and she is just like out on the street losing her mind. And I think that's just more of like, this is how people can start. And then sometimes like bad shit happens in their life that leads them into these darker situations. Mm -hmm. But like, it's just a perspective thing where yeah. you can encounter somebody at points in their life and you're like, they're fine. Like they're doing great and not really understand the reality of their situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've gone one bad choice too far, and now the chase begins. Mm -hmm. This this is like so adrenaline rush. Like, this is where I was like, God damn, I wish I was watching this in a movie theater right now when this whole uh, the chase kicks off. Because okay, how does how's it go? It's a foot chase at first. Well, Gene's on his bike. Like I think he steals oh, yeah. a bike. First like, he checks. I think he just straight up jacks <laughs> yeah. a bike and like takes it. He's booking oh, it yeah, out there. Yeah. And then they end up taking the cab, right? With like the handsome like cab driver guy that right. was like clearly like 
I have a crush on this guy. When Gin shows up on the stolen bike too, he's like so out of breath and he's like bright red and he's like, he's like, red, he's like pantomime. Like, like, what that, has I was happened just like losing speak. it at that part. It's so funny. Yeah, it's like an action scene, but we're making plenty of time for just like gags because yeah, he like, also he, looks so rough. he tries to get on one bike, but it's like spinning out or something. Like he spends a lot of time working out which bike is going to be the bike that's going to get him on the road. So good. <laughs> Okay, so we got we got the cab. <laughs> Jin is like, here we we're not jumping the shark as they say exactly, but we're like these characters are in life or death scenarios here because he so sh- she's stolen like a delivery truck at this point with the baby. Jin rides up alongside of it, and in a great kind yes. of like Mission Impossible esque moment, he like he, he's out of view and we think he's been crushed against like the side of the tunnel, and um. Miyuki's like, oh my god, and you're like, did they kill him? No, he's fine. He's hanging on the <laughs> side like Tom Cruise. <laughs> it's so good. And the camera angles just like there, there's like these little shifts. Things were so like Wes Anderson ish symmetrical earlier on, but now everything's like so dramatically angled and and like uh everything's like italicized at this point in the way the way things are. Ooh. You know, I don't know. That's beautiful. <laughs> it was really nice. It just feels like everything's kind of leaning forward. Um, during I would say this... turnt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would say that. that yeah, that's a that's a you <laughs> word for sure. <laughs> the millennials described it as. <laughs> it now this this whole chase it it's really well done, but it it does play out in ways like I've seen. So she crashes the truck into the building so we're done with that chasing she i will say quickly though that i audibly gasped at that part and i think it's like the involvement of a baby but i was like (gasps) like so loudly when that happened so i was like (laughs) wrapped like i was very involved Mm -hmm. with the characters at that point yeah there's no looking away from like here till the end of the movie at this point so we get we crash the truck it's a great crash scene the cab pulls up now we have the elevator stairs chase, classic action movie. Hilarious. <laughs> Moment. And also hilarious yeah. in this case. <laughs> You're going to be tired when you get to the top. Oh, yeah. We have the, the cab. Uh, the cab drives into the building and then the, the cab driver is like standing there and he points the way because his, his cab is totally yeah. wrecked. Oh, too. right. I yeah, love yeah. that joke. <laughs> That's a great shot. intimately involved in this Because they, they kind of, it's such a stupid joke, the like somebody call an ambulance or whatever. <laughs> Oh, I loved that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that is also, yeah, hilarious. Like, he gets out, call an ambulance. Yeah, it's so good. But the like the cab driver is the same cab driver from earlier in the night. And he he just, like, continues to have to be wrapped up in the story, even though he doesn't want to be. He clearly doesn't want to be part of this. <laughs> but he, like, drives them into the building, and he crashes his cab. And then Hannah and Miyuko come running by, and he's just standing there like, they went that way. <laughs> Like, of course, this has happened to me. It's also an angel cab, I just want to say. Oh, oh. The ride on the top has little angel arms on it. I'm pretty sure, too, if I'm not mistaken, that the number of the cab is the same as the number that was on the key that they found at the beginning. Oh. Wow. There's the a lot to unpack here. Yeah. I wow. don't think Jesus might be involved. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be sure. Jesus runs a cab? company when you think about it he runs all the cab companies oh yeah i never thought thought about that way you're right (laughs) really think about it (laughs) i get really stressed out with elevator scenes i don't know what movie is doing this to me there must have been something i saw with an elevator at some point in my youth but the the way so we're following sachiko and you just know something's going to go horribly wrong because that's just seems where this has to go and you really don't want any of your main characters to get hurt. And when they're all together, it feels safe. But when they start separating and they're all like, uh, when Miyuki is making her way up there first, I'm like, oh my God, she's not, she's going to die. She's it just like when they're apart at this point in the movie, it's just very worrisome in that like kind of horror mm. movie. Like let's split up. It's like, don't split up. Yeah. <laughs> but you're a family. Yeah. Um, it's mm. good. It's just like so tense. Something interesting I noticed here, and they don't really reflect on it in the movie, but we kind of cut out of the main story to follow like the news broadcast for a second, like with the helicopter. Yeah. And for a moment, it it made me wonder, oh, are we going to paint, are we going to do one of those really bummer movie things where 
the outside presence of like the police or authority figures misread the whole situation and kill the wrong person uh, or do something. Uh, but the movie doesn't go there at all. But I'm like, well, clearly a mom and their child is trying to escape some like maniacal homeless people. That's clearly what's going on mm -hmm. if you're just walking into the story. Um, but they don't do that. It's just for some reason we need like a camera shot from above so we can see like the cool helicopter spotlight. So it's just for to frame a shot. <laughs> But I was worried that it was going to go somewhere um, Dark. darker. No, it like weirdly doesn't. That's what, like, I'm still, when did you cry, Ira? When did it happen? Oh, okay. Um... Tell the audience at home. <laughs> <laughs> People want to know. I'm just going to tell you in Jess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll delete it out of the podcast. This, this is partly due to the movie I watched the night before, which was Spike Jones's Adaptation. Have you ever seen Adaptation no. with Nicolas Cage? Jess, you remember this? This is a very like 2003-ish yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. movie. So it must have been something in mm -hmm. the water, the worldly water of, of storytelling. I was too busy being like 12 years old. The so. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Sorry. So young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in that movie, Meryl Streep has the perfect life, which she ruins – by taking, making some wrong choices. And she has this moment where she breaks down and she's like, I wish I could start over. I wish I was a baby again. Um, and that just scene in that movie always just stuck with me because Meryl Streep's great. And it's just like this real tender, just pathetic, truly pathetic moment. And the director even talks about some of this. Anyway, oh, that's another story, this idea of <laughs> Live action feeling. But um, okay, so I, wa I watched Adaptation <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I remember that scene because I hadn't seen the movie in forever. And then I'm watching this movie and when uh, Sachiko's standing on that ledge, she's like, I wish I could just start over. I don't remember exactly what she says, but it's basically the same want, character want. Like, I just want to have a, a fresh take like, I don't know if she says, I want to be a baby again. Mm -hmm. I don't Does think she? so, but I don't. But she's like looking at this baby yeah. and she wants just to, to begin again mm -hmm. and have like everything kind of erased. And it's always, it's like that balance of it's, it's really pathetic because it can't happen. <laughs> it just can't happen. As it's like a little know. too honest. It's kind of, it's so sad because it's honest and it's hopeless all at the same time. Um, so th mm -hmm. that moment, just her saying that, I was just like. I don't know if I ever feel like that, if I'm ever so self caught up in myself where I'm like, I just wish I could, whatever the cost, just start over, whatever the cost to everybody that cares about me, I just want to start over. Um, but this character, just this beat is just like, whew. Um, so that was like just a real deep dive moment that I came right out of. And we won't and, be and putting it in are. the podcast, so it'll just be like <laughs> twenty five seconds of dead air. I don't know. Was that is that not a? I, I, not that I think it should have hit everybody, but it did. That moment just kind of breeze past. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like I have felt that way in my life, and we're not going to go into details about that because that's for me to know. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, for some reason, it didn't really, and I think it was more <laughs> like I I felt really awful for this woman, but she felt like her own character to me. Yeah. So I don't. I just wasn't really thinking about it, and I was. Pretty wrapped up in um, when she finally really realizes, like, how bad this is. And she's like, I'm sorry. Like, she apologizes to the baby. She's crying on the baby, And I think that's, too, yeah, right? it's yeah. just, like, mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. I was very wrapped up with this whole idea of people, like, ba basically figuring their shit out in this movie. And, like, figuring out how to be cool. Like, be okay. Yeah. I don't know. That was really. And that's kind of just where I, what I was thinking during that part. There's a great scene we we skipped over a little bit of where um, that leads into the this part of the movie when Gin is at the husband's house, he's like sort of confronting the husband as if the husband is like a younger version mm, of yeah. himself. Like this this guy is like a past version of Gin, and he's you know finally like saying stuff to himself, like yelling at himself, basically, for doing what he did. Because he's saying, like, you threw your family out, you threw your relationship out, and you threw yourself out. You, th you threw yourself in the trash. Like, that's what you've done. Because he, the husband has sort of divorced himself from having any responsibility or, and, like, caring about his wife or helping her in any way. And I, it's, I think it's, like, really important and beautiful because it's, like, Gin is getting a chance to you know, give this guy some information that like he didn't have, like, you know, you, 
take your life out of the trash and, you know, be a human being and go save your wife and take responsibility for, you know, the people that you love and stuff like that. And it's just like, it's so nice. And it humanizes, it, it really humanizes her too, I think, because it's like, oh, this guy totally abandoned her. Yeah, like he's not even trying. Where is he? Why isn't he right. here? And he did at her? some point, he's just like, I don't even want to mm-hmm. hear about that. And he's like, she's your wife. Like you can't even, you can't opt out of responsibility. Like you're the... Mm-hmm, you're connected mm-hmm. and it's also such a bummer because he he shows up in the perfect hero moment to like save her by shouting at it like, to her die. from the, like... the balcony but then he doesn't pull she jumps mm-hmm. anyway like it's like too late dude like yeah it, where yeah. were you mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. when it mattered way long yeah <laughs> um it's just so like honest because like you could have done that spot you could have done that scene like a bunch of different ways but because I guess the story, the hopeful story, it's not really about them, that couple. So it's like we can kind of like sacrifice their happiness mm-hmm. because we have like our main characters. Well, and the thing, like she survives because the wind yeah, saves her. Right. Which was, I just can't believe we didn't, I didn't notice that. It's a great call out. But like, I like that. Actually, you don't know. I mean, we don't know what happens to them after that. Yeah, I guess Because it doesn't true. dwell on it. And yeah. like, maybe they figure it out. Maybe they go their separate ways, whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we don't need to know. And I like that too. I mean, I'm always a fan of when the movie's like, draw your own conclusions. Like, here is enough information for you to get by. And they didn't really seem like fun people to want to spend too much time with anyway. So that's the other thing. No, I mean, well, they had a lot of problems. Yeah. Now, <laughs> when does the baby talk out loud? Oh, and that's um, after the credits. There's a scene where it's like the baby will, the Tokyo Godfather's oh, will return, yeah. and Nick Fury is there. <laughs> and <laughs> you see the baby in a suit, and it's a boss baby. Oh no! Am I misremembering? Is there not an, a scene in the actual this movie? No, I don't believe that the baby does talk out loud. And I, I must definitely have thought you away were... or no. Well, she she does, she does, but I I think it's like it's we're just getting into the headspace of Sachiko in this movie right. because Sachiko is like having a. <laughs> and a what does the baby moment. say? Do you yeah. remember? Okay. I don't remember what the baby says. The baby says she something stays like, "Cool out there." Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't remember what the baby says, but but yeah, it's something like you know like. I, I, like I want to go home. Or something. Oh, right. oh yeah, yeah, I think right, it is right. that. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. <laughs> be honest, I completely forgot about that. And so I was just like <laughs> razzing you. But that does happen. But that's totally a moment that like people who don't have like good media literacy would look at that and be like, this baby's talking. <laughs> right. This baby is fully speaking is right now. Boss? Like in reality in the movie. Yeah, this baby is a boss. I guarantee that <laughs> happened at least once. Because I, I remember, I think we, we talked about this in one of our Pixar things. The watching, bow? Is that, yeah. yeah. Do you remember the, the short mm-hmm, bow? Mm-hmm, I, I mm-hmm. was in the theater when um when the mom like eats yeah, the dumplings. Same. Somebody was like, oh my god. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, a lot shit. of people reacted audibly. I'm like, Ugh. Just a... like, we're so confused audibly by that part. And I was like, okay. I it, don't feel like this is... There was a mom next to us, like, yeah, who said something the same thing. Where it was like, what is this? This is a movie for kids? What the heck is this? And I was just like, so... It's oh body horror. horror. Yeah, it's just played straight. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> like, I feel so snobbish thinking that, which is like clearly why we have these like issues of like, I'm so much smarter than you. I get it. You, you know, it's like, That's I don't want to judge, but... To show how you know. down to earth and accessible we are. <laughs> like, like, it's definitely like judgmental thinking, but in the in the best way, I think. Um, <laughs> all right. So just the staging of all of this is so good. The, ba- the baby fall. No. All right. What happens? They fall. They fall. Wind saves. Right. Yeah, she, she jumps and Miyuku holds yeah. onto the mom, but the mom is hanging over the side of the building yeah. holding the baby. And then Jin, yeah. and, and she's like, there's no way she could pull the baby up or do anything. Jin comes, grabs her. She's about to fall off. And then the baby's about to fall. Then Hana jumps after it and snatches it out of midair. That's right. Oh my God. And then she's hanging onto like a banner that's on the side of the building and the yeah. banner um, falls down and she's sort of like... I don't even know how to describe it because it's not. It's an invisible presence. It's. Yeah, she just doesn't. She's falling and she's falling. She has this thing and then she ends up sort of like um, being born gently. The winds to of Tokyo. By the, yeah, the spirit of Tokyo. Yeah, because the light, it's like this. 
you see that we're like looking down the road and the sun is rising or is it coming up? I think it's rising. Yeah. Yeah, And it just casts her in like the brightest light we've seen. Like an angel. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) And it's like totally cheesy. You're right. As we describe it. And it's totally like surreal, but it's like exactly what you need to happen as like the watcher of this. When movie. I honestly too, I was like, I think maybe this is why I like really didn't feel too down at any of this point because I was just like ready to get back to the feel good stuff. I didn't know how it ended, uh, but yeah. I was like so taken out in the last scene. Like nothing even really happens that much in the last scene when they're in the hospital together. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hana and Gina are recovering, and like Miyuki is there, and it doesn't even end on a concrete note. Like. She sees her dad again. But I was just like, they're safe. Everybody's fine. Like, the story is over. And then the parents come and they want to turn them into the godfathers of the baby. And I was just like, oh, so cute. Yeah. Right. So I rode out on a real high at the end of this movie. I was feeling it. I was really feeling it. <laughs> it's such the Wayne world, let's pick the happy ending type of thing. It's like, there's the way it might have gone. But then, actually, we're going to show you all it, the it's good. On the, and I think they win the lottery, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like... Yeah. Everything is chill for them. Mm -hmm. But then there's that last dramatic beat where Miyuki's dad is the investigator. And then it just cuts. You're like, Mm -hmm. because you're like, whoa, boy. (laughs) Here we go. Machi (laughs) machi. The guy she stabbed. (laughs) I think you get the idea that, like, that they're going to have a positive reunion. Or maybe that's just the Hana and me, like, being optimistic. I think they just have to, right? Yeah, you sort of feel like it's it's played the same way as Gein seeing his daughter. Mm -hmm. like them seeing each other and she's like dad like just like how kyoko his daughter did the same like she says she sees him and she's like dad yeah and and we have like confirmation in the movie too earlier that her her dad doesn't hold a grudge because she finds like a snippet in the newspaper that says like um, oh, Angel came home yeah Angel came home like please please call us please come home so it's it's clear that like the fam, the, the mom and dad aren't mad at her. They just want to know where she is. They just want to know that she's safe. So it's like, oh, and then she tries to call them. She tries to call them on a on a payphone at one point, but it seems like she just can't work up the nerve to to talk. Yeah, to them. Yeah, she starts crying, and like the dad is like, "Hello," like she he yeah. knows who, like you know, and she just hangs up. Yeah, like they're not. She's not ready. Mm-hmm. But it's nice. It's a cute movie. And then the credits roll and the building start dancing. <laughs> I rewound that part to show it to Neil because I was just like, look at this, look at this. I know. I almost like <laughs> messaged you both in. I'm like, well, we've also seen it. I, don't I actually to, like, would have really appreciated right that though. <laughs> but it... <laughs> but it's just like, it just starts like it's a landscape and it's, nothing's happening. And then it's like, <laughs> like yeah. we're going, we're doing it. And it's really nice. It's so I. I was listening to the composer talk. I think I just mentioned this earlier off the cuff, but it's um, it's just this artist called Night Riders, I think. And he's like the lead dude. And it was the band coming together to do this like interpretation of like the Ninth Symphony. Um, and it's just such oh. a charm. I don't know what the lyrics are that they're putting over it, but it's just so bouncy. Yeah, <laughs> It's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is exactly what you want to hear when you walk out of the theater. Like, I, f- I feel like... With directors like this who are so, not like they're literally in control of everybody, but they're so in control of like the goals and like the experience, not just like what's on the screen, but what you you are feeling when you're watching this movie, like what you need, when you need it, right down to like uh, us parting, me saying goodbye to you. I'm Here's this song. Listen to this as you like walk out of the theater and like talk to your friends. Um, it just seemed, it's just like. I find this sort of thing very inspiring, like these types of movies that are almost like meta in that they are movies about how good movies can be in a way, (laughs) if that makes sense. It's just such a fucking perfect 90 minute movie. There's like no hole in it, right? It's not, there's no leak in this story Mm -hmm. at all. Just so whether you love the story or not, like you can't deny it's like a great movie. (laughs) Well, like I, maybe I'm just like, we're in a bleak time and things have been stressful for a long time globally, internationally. But like, it's been a long time since I've seen a new movie that I was like, oh, this is like a feel good movie. Yeah. Nobody at the end like mm-hmm. shot each other to death <laughs> or actually mm-hmm. jumped off a building and died. Like that didn't happen. And mm-hmm. then I walked out feeling like good and like having met these characters that were really pleasant generally to be around even when they're being kind of unpleasant 
like when they don't make these movies anymore i don't know if that's true or not but like it really <laughs> felt sure we'll very <laughs> unique yeah and like yeah. i i miss that I, like i just i think i've talked to you multiple times about how i have a really hard time committing to watching tv shows anymore and i think there's for a number of reasons but one of them honestly is that a lot of them are just so miserable and i'm like i'm yeah. a little tired i'm a little tired of it like i just want to watch something cute i would like a hug from my television like i don't want mm. i just don't need any more dramatic stuff about how people are bad and like everything's bad like i know that and this was just like yeah you want you yeah. want some hope and it's yeah. like why like, hana was such a nice character is like she's just like we're gonna get through this like things are fine like and she says like god loves this baby and gene's like what the are you talking about like she got thrown in the trash but i was like but hana's like way of looking at that yes. is mm -hmm. much healthier <laughs> in the long term right be, like yeah. appreciate what you have like don't be upset about what about the trash that you got thrown into <laughs> yeah she she really like lights up yeah. the whole movie and yeah. this this movie it's it's yeah. about all the things trashy dramatic television is about we talked about abuse alcoholism like all, all these things but the movie doesn't like wield them over you like a like a guillotine in the way like some shows do. It's like, look, somebody's cheating on somebody, and when they get caught, holy shit, mm -hmm. they are fucking in for it, and you're gonna live it with them. It's like right. you can talk about adultery, you can talk about anything in many different ways, and this movie like does it by balancing it with like hope. But we can still be like, that woman almost died of suicide, and we can like talk about how she was feeling. But she didn't have to die and we didn't have to feel really sad about it. But we can still, like, think about the idea of it in the same way. Yeah. Uh, in a way, right. right? Like, have empathy about it. Yeah, like, su like super compassionate, super empathetic. It's like, yeah, bleak things are happening. But, like, there's still hope because, you know, th there are people who really do believe in, like, being good to each other. You know, and we feel like we've watched a movie about, like people who really want to be good to each other yeah it's about like family that's cute as hell it's nice especially the yeah. family thing like i know that's kind of you know that's not a new concept but i think it's important i like movies that are about people communally and not about because like this easily mm -hmm. could have been a movie about gene exclusively right. and yeah. his like inner conflict and like oh and like the inevitability of like my dark side turning me against my family and it's like boring like actually what people need is a to be cool with to each other and like be nice and also like mm -hmm. try to be hopeful about what you can do like it's people can turn stuff around like a lot of stuff in their lives so it doesn't have to be like oh i've crossed the path like the point of no return and i guess it's just over for me like i couldn't escape my demons so I'm just like no mm -hmm, mm -hmm. throw that in the trash that's the baby i don't want <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's all for now. Check out our episode archive and other facts over at cartoonfeelings.com. You can tweet at us or join us on Instagram. And both of those you will find at Feeling Cartoons. And if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to go the extra mile for your two friends, Kayla and I, <laughs> yeah. we'd be super grateful if you would take the time to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and or a review and share us with your friends. Uh, and we continue to threaten that if you leave a funny or cool review, we'll read it on the show. Yeah, so get so funny and cool you. real quick. Yeah. Oh, that Your guys nice. are great. Yeah, keep it up. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye.